from NBC News. The funeral of Diana, Princess of Wales. Live from London, here are Tom Brokaw and Katie Couric. Good morning, everyone. This is the day that no one expected would happen, certainly not in this fashion. A princess without a throne, but with the power of the people, not just in her own nation, but around the world, the power of love will be buried in ceremonies fit for a queen or for a king, Katie Curry. Tom Brokaw, it's hard to believe that almost a week ago, groggy Brits were waking up, turning on their television set, and incredulously getting the seemingly incomprehensible news that 36-year-old Diana, 36, the Princess of Wales, their princess in good times and bad times, was gone in an instant, and now they and the rest of the world are waking up to say their final goodbyes. It's been a long and emotional week. It reached proportions that no one could have anticipated, of course. We'll be talking about that all day long here as we have special coverage on NBC. We're joined not just by members of the NBC family, but by authorities from this country and this culture as well. Tina Brown, who's the editor of The New Yorker, a native of Britain, was with me 16 years ago, Tina, when we That's were right. witness to the wedding. We could not have anticipated it would have this kind of an end, obviously. It's certainly a very sad sequel. Also, Andrew Roberts, who is from the Sunday Times of London, who is a historian as well, who will be taking us through a lot of the protocol and the ceremonies of this day and offering his perspective. We want to tell you that uh, we have members of the NBC family out there as well. Jane Pauley. Jane, it was 16 years ago. You're at Canada Gate now at Buckingham Palace that we all sat there together and we were witness to the largest television audience I think that we had ever appeared before. Now we've come back under far different circumstances again for this exceptional outpouring of emotion. What is going on at Buckingham Palace right now? Well, Tom, the Queen and Prince Charles and the Princes William and Harry are in Buckingham Palace as we speak. And I know that because over the uh, palace, you see the royal standard is, uh, is flying. As soon as they leave this morning, that flag, the standard, will be lowered. Uh, this is common practice. It announces the presence of the Queen, and when she leaves, it's removed. Then precedent begins. For the first time ever in history, the Union Jack will be raised in the royal standard's place, and it will fly at half-staff. Uh, this will be a symbol of a transition of tremendous import. Thanks very um, much. Jane Polly will be coming back to you throughout the day, of course. We want to give you a small idea now of just what you can expect in the opening hours of this long and exceptional day. Princess Diana's body was taken yesterday from St. James's Palace to Kensington Palace, which is her official residence. They had to expand the route of the procession, obviously, because there's been such an outpouring, probably more than a million people in the streets here. That's today. right. They had to triple the uh, length of the route, Tom, and the police commissioner says he is prepared to deal with as many as six million people who might show up along the funeral route. He says this is uncharted territory. You'll be going through some, and you'll be joining us as we do this, through some historic places in this capital city of this ancient nation, obviously, past Buckingham Palace and Hyde Park, working our way to Westminster Abbey, which was consecrated a thousand years ago. This is obviously the most important religious site in this nation where there have been so many kings and queens who have been coronated and buried here. And down in the crowd, which has been camped here for a couple of days now, is Jody Applegate of NBC News and MSNBC. Jody is there, and we'll be hearing from her throughout the course of the day. And back at Buckingham Palace, which has become a kind of instant shrine to Diana, even though she was effectively shown the door there a few years ago, uh, here is uh, NBC's Sarah James. There have been millions of dollars spent by commoners in this country, the working class, bringing their families to Buckingham Palace. We'll be hearing from Sarah James as well today. Uh, and back at Westminster in the crowd once again, NBC's Kevin Tibble. So we, uh, we're going to be, I think, fully covered here, Katie. One commentator noted last night on British television that it's somewhat ironic that a 13th century abbey would be the place to hold a funeral for a thoroughly modern princess. Some people have called her the uh, first princess of the new age. Uh, she called herself the queen of the people's hearts. And Tony Blair, who was the British prime minister here, said that she was the princess of the people. Let's ask uh, Tina Brown what her friends in Britain are saying about 
the impact of all of this on this nation and whether I know that everyone here was uh, astonished at the kind of outpouring of grief, the depth of it, that, that she meant a lot to people. But do they think that this is some kind of a watershed time? They do. Uh, everybody, of course, has been shocked and astonished and moved and awed by the response. And I think people really feel that it's almost as if the British people have decided to renegotiate their contract with the royal family and demanded of them that they will now listen to the lessons that Diana tried to really make them listen to while she was alive, that the English people want a different kind of monarchy now. They do want a more communicative, more obviously caring, uh, less stuffy, less rigid, less hidebound by protocol kind of a monarchy and um, they want it and they, they've asked for it in, in, in very clear voices. I thought it was very interesting, Tina and Andrew, that Queen Elizabeth during her address to the nation, an unprecedented address except for one in 1991 during the Gulf War, that she said there are lessons to be learned from Diana's life and the, from the reaction to her death. Do you think she was talking about personal lessons, lessons for the palace? I think this is very much more a personal than a political occasion. It's uh, obviously one has to um, only look behind us to see what a massive event it is. But I think the messages that it's giving are mostly about the person of Diana and how much she was loved than um, anything to do with, uh, with politics. I think Tina's absolutely right to say that the palace has got to modernize, but certain things they've done this week implies that they have at least learned that lesson. Do you think that the royal family will become before sometime in the 21st century just simply ceremonial here? Um, well, it is pretty much simply ceremonial now, apart from there are a few prerogative powers that it still retains, which um, the Labour government are uh, interested in uh, cutting back. But nevertheless, there's going to be quite a, a big political debate before that happens. Do you think that through some of the actions they took in the latter part of the week that they got back into the public's good graces? I don't think they were ever definitely out of them. The, um, the way in which the young princes, whom everybody speaks about, uh, what feeling the best uh, interests of, but nevertheless, they were forced to grieve in a public way um, rather than in the way that they had hitherto chosen. And I think that um, they therefore have got an awful lot of uh, sympathy from the public for having done that. Apparently, the public can be fairly capricious in its attitudes towards the royal family. The, the front page of the London Mail on Thursday says, why isn't the royal family showing its grief? And on Friday, the headline was, why we must support the royal family. Well, there has been an ebb and flow throughout history about yes. the relationship between the people and, and the monarchy. They do. I mean, it seemed actually, I felt somewhat invasive, really, of the tabloids to keep telling the royal family how they should grieve. Um, you know, when you're grief-stricken, you do shut yourself up into solitude. And I, I, I think that the Queen rightly thought about her grandchildren and rightly spent her time with them and felt less uh, about the sort of public PR position of what she should be showing than what she, sh what she felt about her family. And I, I really warm to her, frankly, for putting her children first. And, her. and she gave quite an effective speech, didn't she? She did. I mean, for her, it was a very uh, effective speech, you know. I mean, she has, she has a formal demeanor. She, she can't emote in the way that people sort of want her to, which is, which is unfair because that's not who she is. But she did her best. And I think by calling the princess Diana rather than the princess and by, uh, you know, evoking herself as a grandmother as well as a queen, um, I think she did move people very much. And while she said that she admired uh, Princess Diana, she never used yeah. the word love, however. Katie, I think Kevin Tibbles is down in the crowd. That's right, he's down in the crowd with one of the many, many people who, has, who have staked out a position for days. Is that right, Kevin? Well, Katie, I'm speaking with Jackie Fulton, who's come in on the train from Essex, which is outside of London, to be here today. And uh, we're j I'm just going to ask you, what uh, did your family think when you made the decision to come down here? My husband thought I was completely mad, but I just felt it was very important that we came as a mark of respect. I've come with a friend, and the atmosphere is wonderful. It's nice to be British. Why was it important for you to be here yourself? Why couldn't you just stay home and watch it on television with the other millions? I wouldn't have felt the same. Um, the respect that everybody feels for Diana and the work she did, the caring role that she had, it's just wonderful, wonderful. For you today, is it a sign, the fact that the royal family, the Queen, did come out yesterday, is it a sign today that perhaps all of the hiatus and the publicity over the way the funeral has been handed has now ended and the country can start grieving for Diana properly? I think so, and I think it's very important that the royal family 
showed the people that they're here, but they did need the privacy in Balmoral, and, and I thought it was very moving, her speech, and it, it was human, very approachable. What do you mean when you say it makes you proud to be British again? Just look around you, feel the atmosphere. It's wonderful. wonderful. Interestingly enough, some people have actually even broken into song of, as we've been talking here. Back upstairs to you. Sarah James is now down at Buckingham Palace talking with some other people who thought it was very important that they make their presence known today. Sarah? That's right, Katie. Wahid and Diana Maud came from Slow, which is about 20 miles away from London. Diane, you were saying that London seems very different today. Yeah, it's very quiet. Um, you've got thousands of people all covering uh, parts of London, and it, I've never seen it so quiet. Wahid, why did you decide that it was so important for you to come and be here today? I think the main reason was uh, to relieve my pain and grief to come down here and pay my respect. Otherwise, uh, I would have felt really bad. And uh, the way she was, she was unique. And uh, she did a lot of things for the poor people. And I think that's the main reason why I'm here. Diane, you were saying she was a very different kind of monarch. We're right here in front of Buckingham Palace. Was she like the rest of the palace, in your opinion? No, very different. Um totally different to any of the royals I've known. I, I mean, I wouldn't say I was a royalist, but um, since she's come into the royal family, I think there's been a lot more public interest. Um, but she's very much a people's person. Um, she's wanted to keep the, try and drop these barriers between the monarchy and uh, just the ordinary public. Thank, thank you both so much. We also have an American who's with us. And Katie, that's one of the remarkable things about all of this, is that people from all over the country are here. Megan Fitzgerald from Albany, why are you here? I just wanted to come by. I was leaving uh, Europe today and just to see everything that was going on. Uh, it's sad. You can't imagine just walking around with thousands and thousands of people just keeping to themselves, being very quiet. I mean, there's literally thousands of people, and it's extremely quiet. It's sad. It's very sad. You said it reminded you of a tragedy in the United States. The uh, biggest tragedy in my lifetime in the United States was the Oklahoma City bombing. And there you were just glued to the television set, just wanting to see every little bit of information you could, trying to find out what was happening, what was going on. Uh, similar to this, you just wanted to know what was going on and what was happening. Are you struck by the silence, Megan? Yes. Yes. I got off the train uh, last night, and I came in and walked around. Just crowds of people, you know, you're huddled together just walking, but it's silent. All right, well, thank you so much. A, a number of the people who are here at Buckingham Palace lining the route, waiting for the funeral cortege to come by. Katie? Thank you, Sarah. You know, it seems as if people are certainly saddened by the death of Princess Diana, but that something else altogether is at work here, that they want to be part of the communal experience. They want to be witnesses to history. Well, this is uh, an occasion that uh, they'll not likely see again in their lifetime. Now, having said that, you know, there may be something that will come up in a few more years. But that young woman, I was struck by the fact that the defining moment in her life in terms of tragedy with the Oklahoma City bombing. Which made you feel very old, I'm right. sure. Right. Others think about the... <laughs> made me feel old, too, Tom. Right. Others talk about the Kennedy people, obviously, or the shuttle going down. Uh, let's go now to Kensington Palace, the cortege is about to leave. That's the official residence. It's uh, at one end of Hyde Park, and Diana maintained an apartment there that was part of her settlement when she was divorced from Prince Charles, and the boys lived there with her. I tend to think that Kensington Palace uh, apartments were quite grand, but in fact they're surprisingly small. They, um, there was a small sitting room, uh, four bedrooms, uh, and a dining room that seated 16. So that in fact when Prince Charles and Diana were there together, particularly when things were strained, it was very small for them and quite claustrophobic. Um, they couldn't expand because it would mean they'd have to evict someone else in the royal family in a neighboring apartment. In fact, a number of royals live at Kensington Palace, don't they, Andrew? No, several. And um, it's, they, they all live cheek by jowl, as, uh, as Tina was saying. Let's just take a moment and savor this. You hear the bells of Westminster Abbey in the background. Cortege, you'll be hearing them, they'll be towing once every minute. When King George died, who was led this country through World War II, they told every minute for his lifetime. 
There has been a dispute, Andrew, a bit about uh, using a gun carriage and having any military uh, association with Diana because she was so active in the anti-landmine movement. And they have kept it to a minimum here in terms of ceremony, haven't they? They absolutely have. Uh, when Winston Churchill died, there were 7,000 troops at, uh, at the ceremony. I think the gun carriage is a little unfair to criticize them over this because um, Princess Diana, um, although she was, of course, uh, anti-militaristic, was never naive about this and uh, often went to visit the troops in Northern Ireland, including this regiment itself. You can see the crowd is very deep, very long, more than a million people expected here today, and very respectful. 4,000 police duty. Police are on duty, Tom, and they've been instructed not to look at the procession, but to keep their eyes on the crowd. Prime Minister Tony There's Blair. The prime, the prime Minister who had a very close association with her. He is now described as the head of the new Labour Party and wants to change things in this country. Tina, you know the Prime Minister. His uh, relationship with her was very strong. In fact, she thought that uh, the monarchy ought to take some clues from how he had won the hearts of the people here. Yes, yeah, she was a big, uh, she had a lot of hope in the whole Tony Blair era. She felt that he was going to be the agent for change that might even, uh, you know, help change the royal family. And she did say that in June when I, when I met her that um, she felt that his advisor, Peter Mandelson, was just exactly what the royal family needed to help advise them and, and change their attitudes to the media. I know he, she also told you that he was one person who would know how to use her properly. Yes, yeah, she believed that, and, and it was true, that he felt she could be very, very helpfully used on specific missions, particularly to China. She wanted to go to China, and she, she felt she was going to be able to persuade him to, to, you know, to back her in that. And that was already beginning to drive the Tories around the bend a little bit, the Conservative Party here. They were calling her naive, would become, she's, one of them said, anonymously a week before her death she'd become an instrument of the Labour Party. I, I think that it was simply that she felt she had a rapport with a younger, uh, more idealistic, um, more communicative kind of Prime Minister. He was just the kind of person she could talk to and it was easy for her to forge a bond with him. This journey to Westminster Abbey is expected to take about an hour and 47 minutes. The six horses, there was, so, there was some concern that they might get slightly agitated walking through such an enormous crowd. So yesterday at their barracks, apparently soldiers threw artificial flowers and rolled up newspapers at them to see what their reaction would be to ensure that they would remain calm if the crowd did not. guards part of this procession this ceremony has been described as a unique ceremony for a unique person Buckingham Palace and the royal establishment here as you might expect has a complete set of plans for everyone who was a member of the family but because she no longer carried the HRH title they no longer had contingency plans for her that was one of the reasons that it was delayed for a full week when you see that casket coming on this procession and these crowds turn out, it almost seems inadequate to say that it is Shakespearean. It goes beyond that. It is um, inadequate, but um, there's so much to it. The um, raw standard that you see there has got, just as it did in uh, Shakespeare's Henry V, the fleur-de-lis of France as part of the, uh, the standard. Now, we haven't had any possessions in France since 1558, but nevertheless, that doesn't mean that anything uh, has to change with the flag. On top of the coffin, white lilies, Diana's favorite flowers. I think you must ask Tina about that. She's more likely to know. Yes, white lilies were her favorite flowers, and um, it's certainly what she would have wanted. Let's just absorb the moment here.
the noises we hear in the background are actually sobs coming from people who are gathered. Many have spent three nights here. Well, the utter reality of it all becomes crystal clear when this Cortez passes, obviously. And they think about Diana, the height of her life, 36 years old, transcendent beauty, struggling to find some happiness. And then this. I think the image burned on the minds of many people most vividly is Princess Diana, mother, mother of two young sons, William, 15, and Harry, next week, 13. No, she will burn in the public mind forever as a, as a, as a perennial, as 36 forever, and any flaws in her character, any, any criticisms of her character uh, are all been expunged by the tragedy and the untimeliness of her death. <laughs> Do you think that there will be any uh, any time for young William and Harry now, after all of this and all of the discussion about the attention of the press, the paparazzi, members of the royal family, that there will be any immunity for them from that for a period of time? Well, there's an unwritten deal done with uh, editors of national newspapers that they will not intrude into the children's education. One can only hope and pray that um, Prince William does not now inherit his mother's position as the number one media interest figure, and they then break this, uh, this agreement. If that does happen, then who's to say um, he might well go the same way as her? It would be just impossibly tragic if that did. He already has an intense dislike for the press and one that was on is only likely to have been hugely increased by the events of the last week. We're hearing the tenor bell from Westminster Abbey toll half muffled every minute during the procession. What can you tell us about the Welsh guards? The eight guardsmen, four on each side of the coffin as they march, and two behind, are from the elite household regiment, the, the Welsh Guard. It was formed in 1915 during the Great War. It served with enormous distinction across um, northern Europe in the Second World War and in every other major field of uh, theatre of conflict since then. It uh, is close to the heart of the Prince of Wales, and the Princess visited it on many occasions. The Prince of Wales is the Colonel-in-Chief. It's won Victoria Crosses in several of the uh, most uh, arduous battlefields of, uh, of the century. And Richard Williams, the leading guardsman, is quite a hero in this country. He's quite a hero. Um, all of the guardsmen are over six feet. Richard Williams is, uh, is a little bit taller than that, and he's much loved in the regiment. He won a military cross, the um, next gallantry medal down from the Victoria Cross, when he saved 100 Cambodian villagers when he was a volunteer for the United Nations expeditionary force in Cambodia in 1993. This medal was given him personally by the Prince of Wales and he has been chosen specifically to lead the procession um, or at least lead the guards detachment of the procession. NBC's Keith Miller is along the Cortez route. Keith? Well, we are witnessing an historical moment. Uh, the gun carriage is slowly making its way from Kensington Palace, the former home of Princess Diana. The crowd's about eight deep here, very solemn. Uh, at least at the beginning, it uh, was a little bit noisy. It has quieted down as the funeral procession slowly makes its way by. The gun carriage, of course, with the King's troops, Royal Horse Artillery. The coffin is on an oak platform just above a gun that was actually used in the First World War. A very, very solemn ceremony, and I must say, uh, the people here realize that they are witnessing an historic moment. We'll witness it with them for a few moments. 
you can see from the expressions on the faces of the people just how deeply attached they were to Diana, Princess of Wales. as in her life, the, this kind of ceremony. She really was the one who was called to resolve those conflicts between modernity and tradition in this country, wasn't she? She was a bridge. She was a bridge, and uh, she fought for the change. Um, it's an incredible irony that she really, in the end, has achieved uh, what is uh, really a, a, sh a shaking to the core of, of the royal sort of self-image uh, by her death. I mean, uh, she begged them really to rethink the way they did many things and felt trapped by uh, the protocol and, and trapped by the court and trapped by uh, the palace way. And, um, she was often belittled for that, but in dying, I think everyone's understood that, that she was right. Um, I think that's part of the moving nature of today's emotionism. She was a bridge, and yet she sometimes, Andrew Roberts, crossed that bridge and rankled not only members of the royal family, but members of the British public as well, did she not? I think that it's very easy to exaggerate um, this in that um, the odd member of parliament, and you get some very odd members of parliament, do not uh, necessarily speak for the, uh, for the public. Uh, you only have to look behind you to realise how she was, although many people uh, scoffed at it at the time, um, the queen of people's hearts. I wonder, though, um, whether these Conservative members of Parliament, how they feel now, having, um, having criticised her, usually off the record, in a, in a fairly cowardly um, way. I, um, I wonder how they must feel today. One member of the Conservative Party said that Labour, the party of Tony Blair, was trying to hijack the affections of a susceptible, volatile, and politically inexperienced woman who was in a sensitive position. That was just a few days before her death. It was that kind of attack that she was constantly subjected to her. And that was about the, the position against landmines. And she quickly said, this is not a political position I'm taking. It's a humanitarian position. Keith Miller along the Cortez route. Quite remarkable here. The cortege has just passed us uh, about a minute ago or so, and a lot of people are not leaving their positions along these uh, pedestrian guardrails. They're just lingering here. I think a lot of them don't know what to do, uh, where to go next, because what they've seen is historic and it has now passed them by. Uh, of course, the uh, former home of uh, Princess Diana Kensington Palace is now empty, uh, and I think there's a sense of finality here which perhaps is draining them. They're just not moving. They're just staying right where they were when the uh, procession moved by. Many people are, of course, milling around, but a considerable number not leaving, and we are still seeing people arriving here placing flowers and notes of sympathy. It's remarkable that it continues even though the procession has passed us. We want to show you now a map of uh, the route itself and where it is along that route. Uh, I'm going to act as a kind of a sunscreen for Katie here so that we can look at it in here in the bright sunshine. Uh, they're about Royal Albert Hall. Um, and Royal Albert Hall obviously is a, an important place here. Those of you who have come to London in the past know that it is uh, one of the great concert halls. Uh, everyone from Lowell Thomas to Luciano Pavarotti have performed there. Uh, in fact, I think that it was there that uh, Diana may have heard Pavarotti the first time, Andrew. It's a great cultural center and has been since it was built by um, contributions of the general public in 1872, at the same time as the Albert Memorial. These were uh, another outpouring of national grief um, for the death of Queen Victoria's husband, who also died at a, at a young age, but not so tragically young as this. And now the cortege enters Hyde Park. 
The reeds were told uh, on the casket are from her brother, Earl Spencer, and one from each son, a total of three on the casket. Park where two big screen television sets have been placed. I think three now. Well, one at St. Regent's Park, I understand, or is it Regent's Park? We're not sure, but there are three. Yes, you might be right, there are three in total. Huge screens, too. But lots of people don't want to go and watch this on huge screens. They think that if they're going to watch it at all, they should watch it on the television if they're not going to be there. And if they are going to be there, they want to see the real thing. It is a real coming together of ancient tradition and the modern age of uh, this television broadcast scene around the world today, obviously, and uh, it has been pervasive uh, since early Sunday morning when we first learned of the accident and then subsequently the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. It is still unclear whether Prince William Prince and Prince Harry will be following the coffin in the procession. It was reported that Prince Charles wanted to see how they were faring and how they were holding up before the ultimate decision was made. Katie, the ultimate destination here, obviously, is Westminster Abbey, and the doors now have been opened to the Abbey as people begin to arrive. They expect some 2,000 altogether, and it is going to be an eclectic combination of the British political establishment, but also the cultural establishment, and celebrities from around the world, Tina. You know? Yes, well, the, uh, of course, there was no um, real system laid out to get these guests together, because people didn't know uh, really how to make the list. So in fact, the way the list was made, certainly in the first invitations that went out, were to her last Christmas card list. And, you know, some of her friends thought it was sort of, uh, it was a strange group that was receiving invitations because, you know, it was everybody from sort of hairdressers and makeup people to someone she'd met at the gym. And, you know, Christmas card lists are, are, are a strange melee of the things you've done all year. So in the end, they called in one of her uh, older uh, private secretaries who'd been with her longer, who'd now left, and asked for his help and said, you know, please try to sort out who was a real friend and, and, and who was just someone that she'd got to know that year. The fact that it is not a state funeral apparently gave the Spencer family much more flexibility in terms of who they wanted to invite. They were not obliged to invite heads of state. And in fact, in many cases, invited the first ladies. Yes, in fact, it's very much a woman's uh, you know, ceremony today. There are, there are many, many, Diana had many, many women friends. And I think, interestingly, women of every kind of caste and color and state, uh, station in life felt a tremendous empathy with her. Um, you know, her, her broken marriage, her attempts to, you know, self-realization, her, her bad romances. I mean, they, I mean, every woman can identify with it. Her bad body image. Her bad body image, yes. Uh, this will take about an hour and 47 minutes altogether if it uh, stays on schedule. And then at 11 a.m. in the morning here in London, and that would be 6 a.m. Eastern time in America, the funeral services will begin at Westminster Abbey, and we think that they'll run for about 45 minutes. Then there will be a minute of silence nationwide, and then there will be another procession to the family estate north of London, where she will be buried, now we're told, on an island in a lake on the family estate, not at the family chapel. The family chapel is open to people in the community who worship there, and apparently they were relieved, greatly relieved, when they heard the news that she would not be buried there because they fear that it would become this huge tourist attraction, well, rightly so. They were terrified it was going to become Graceland. Uh, it's the last thing they want. It's a quiet little village. It's been in the family for a long time. And it would be an awful intrusion on the sensibilities of that small village of some 200 people. I think there is something extremely romantic and uh, uh, about burying her on an island in a lake. It has a, uh, has a wonderful uh, and yet at the same time a great beauty um, for her. I, I thought it was an interesting choice because Earl Spencer said the day after she was killed that she's finally in a place where no one can touch her. Exactly, they can't get her there. 
a temporary bridge will be placed to the island during the burial. It's unclear if that will remain, but the Spencer family will open up the burial site for a few weeks every year so people can come by and see it. Supposedly has strong childhood attachments. You can almost envision her frolicking and playing. So she used to love to walk beside that lake. That was one of her favorite places to go for an early morning walk. Um, she and William and Harry had all planted oak trees in the area, Spencer family tradition since 1833. As we watch this cortege uh, proceed now to Westminster Abbey, we're told that the official estimates of the crowd now is over a million. Uh, the official estimate is over a million in the city of London, and it is growing. We have some additional information for the flowers, those of you who have been watching this casket in this solemn procession through the streets of London. The roses, we're told, are from her youngest son, Harry, in the front of the casket. The tulips are from William in the back. The lilies are from her brother, Earl Spencer, who was known as Lord Althup, you may remember, and he worked for a time for NBC News, but he now lives in South Africa, and he was in a understandable rage when this occurred, especially against the paparazzi. He said, I always believed that they would cause the death of her, but I think he always meant that metaphorically. He was very, very close to Diana because when their mother left uh, for Peter Shan Kid, the two uh, eldest girls were at boarding school, and it was Diana who would listen to the sobs of, uh, of her brother at night crying for his mother, and it would be she who would go to his room to comfort him. She was part of the British aristocracy, but she did have a difficult childhood, Tina, didn't she, with her mother leaving? She had an extraordinarily difficult childhood. I mean, it is unusual uh, for a mother not to be, uh, you know, to, to leave the entire brood like that. And it was a very hard hand that um, uh, Mrs. Shan Kidd was dealt when the court decided that she would not get custody of the children. And it often happened at that time, and particularly for the aristocracy. Um, but. It, it was a terrible blow from which her mother never really recovered and certainly, uh, I think, damaged uh, the six-year-old Diana tremendously to be to just lose all that support and, and love from, from her mother so early. Especially when her father made what was in her eyes a bad second marriage. Yeah, she did not like uh, rain uh, at all. Uh, I mean, it's very hard for any stepmother uh, coming in in that sort of situation. But the children did not like her, and uh, you know that that added to her feeling of alienation and betrayal and confusion. It's now being reported, after much speculation about whether. Prince William and Prince Harry will follow the cortege, that they will join it at the Mall, which is called Mall here. Mal. Yes, that's right. Along with Prince Charles and Earl Spencer. Well, we're very close to that now. I mean, we're, we're uh, that, that shan't be too, too long from now that uh, they will be getting it. We're, we're in Hyde Park, and the Mall is the uh, area that proceeds from Buckingham Palace, passing Cambridge Palace. through um, Wellington Arch, called the Constitution Arch as well, uh, which is a tribute to the great uh, military hero, the Duke, obviously, and that is closed to the rest of us, but it is used only by the royal family. It's the Wellington Arch, uh, just above Constitution um, Hill, and uh, named after the, uh, the Duke. It was where the Duke's um, house, actually house, that was uh, built for him by a grateful nation after the Battle of Waterloo. Um, is situated, and then uh, Constitution Hill goes beside the gardens of Buckingham Palace. Um, considering we don't have a written constitution, it's a uh, it's a curious name, but nevertheless. But they, and they took down uh, the statue of the Duke there and put up a peace chariot. Or they did, but then the um, then the statue was replaced, and there were also some splendid uh, war memorials there as well. Some of uh, some of the most impressive work of our. Um, of our architect, uh, Turbin Luxions.
of Prince William and Prince Harry following their mother's coffin will undoubtedly be perhaps the most heart-wrenching scene we see all day long. They and Prince Charles, as we all know, showed up yesterday at St. James's Palace and spoke to some of the people who had gathered there. It was extremely moving to see uh, you know, this sort of awkward and shy and sweet, you know, Prince William and then the very young Prince Harry. Um, it's the hardest of all for him at the age of 11. Um, and very ironic that uh, Princess Diana, who had been left herself so young by her mother and is so determined for her children, have a really warm present. We're seeing him now, uh, just briefly there on videotape, and they received a number of uh, bouquets from the well-wishers, and they were, I must say, for these youngsters who have been raised, obviously, in this kind of life, but they have such dignity and such presence, uh, young William, who is not happy about uh, making these kinds of public appearances, uh, was the son that every mother would want to have yesterday. He was very, very close to Diana, too, because he was of the age where he could comfort her, and he often did. And he, once, when she was in tears, uh, he pushed uh, some Kleenex under the bathroom door and said, I hate to see you cry. And when she told him about the book by James Hewitt, he apparently said, oh, mummy, you've been hurt. Here's a box of chocolates to make you feel better. So he's a very, very empathetic young man. She once described him as seeming almost 30 years old after he gave a welcome speech at one of her Christmas parties. And he, of course, he looks very much like her, too, which is... We are... Um, the, it has now passed through the Prince of Wales Gate, Andrew. Um, you're probably seeing this better at home than we are because we have lights in our television monitors here and we're having a little difficulty knowing exactly where we are at all times. Uh, this is the crowd. It is beginning to come. You can see Sting. He is arriving at right. Westminster Abbey along with his wife, Trudy. Yes. He and Elton John, of course, sang at Gianni Versace's funeral, the very same funeral where Elton John was comforted by Princess Diana. He is one of the 1900 invited guests. Clinton, of course, will be here representing the United States. David Frost, who uh, knew her well and has been uh, a ubiquitous figure in this culture for a long, long time, obviously, Sir David Frost now. David is married to Lady Karina Howard, who is um, one of the daughters of the Duke of Norfolk, so he sort of uh, adopted really all the sort of friends of the aristocracy, and that's really how he got to know the Princess of Wales. The Duke of Norfolk, of course, as Earl Marshall, would, would have... Um, the Duke of Norfolk, as Earl Marshall, would have organised this had it been a state funeral. He only um, uh, was allowed to step down because it's not officially run. It's worth uh, saying that um, others have not had a state funeral as well, but the, the one that is, this one is compared to, Andrew, is Lord Montman, who was known as Uncle Dickie, obviously. He was a very, very influential figure in the family, very close to Prince Charles, and when he was killed, when he was assassinated by IRA terrorists, they gave him a funeral that was like this, unique and stately, but not officially a state funeral. Um, but Mountbatten himself drew it up, and uh, all the details of it, and so uh, he always enjoyed having a good show, and he had behind him two people holding uh, cushions with all his medals and orders and decorations on them. Um, although Princess Diana won um, medals and orders for her uh, humanitarian uh, work, she wouldn't have crossed her mind to have uh, had that sort of flummery. <laughs> the most enduring image of that Mountbatten funeral was his charger which rode in the procession with his lifeguard's boots reversed in the stirrups. Tom, Tom Hanks and Tom Cruise and Steven Spielberg, Steven Spielberg is uh, there as well. 
Tom Cruise, of course, railed against the paparazzi following Princess Diana's death, saying that he had experienced the same level of harassment and called for it to stop. Nicole Kidman, his wife, is with him, uh, with Tom Cruise. She's a member of the Commonwealth, obviously, who came from Australia. She did uh, touch many lives and move through many circles uh, pretty easily, Tina. Yeah, she had many friends amongst the fashion world and um, many friends amongst the pop culture world. And she also made friends with the people who, you know, were her sort of wardrobe mistresses, face artists. I mean, one of them was a lady she used to call a lot on a Saturday night who was a kind of a makeup artist, who a little more than that because she was also a sort of therapist as well. And in fact, often on a Saturday night when she was alone at Kensington Palace, she would, she would call this woman and say, you know, you told me to call if I'm ever alone. I am. I'm alone again on a Saturday night. And um, they would talk about her problems. Sarah James is at Buckingham Palace with uh, someone that knew Diana. And it's worth pointing out, by the way, Sarah, that I think that there are something like 100 representatives of the various charities that Diana was close to who were involved in this procession today. And it makes so much sense, Tom, because she gave so much to so many people. And indeed, the person we're about to talk to is an example of that. So many of the famous are filing into that church, and Vincent Seabrook isn't famous. In fact, the way you met Princess Diana is very unusual. You were asking her for money. Yeah, so I was actually uh, living on the streets, and uh, I just, you know, I was really tired, and I was asking members of the public for money, um, you know, just to live. Um, and uh, it all happened all of a sudden. It was Did you realize it was the princess? No, no, not at all. Not until um, I'd asked, I'd asked her, and she turned around, and then I realised it was a princess, and I just felt like I wanted the world to swallow me up there and then. What did she do? She came back over to me, and she crouched down, and she just asked me my name, um, my age, why I was on the street, where's my parents. Um, and she was, you know, she sat down and talked to me, um, you know, just telling me, you know, why am I on the street, you know, and what she does for people. She got you some food, didn't she? She did, yes. She got me, uh, she went her way and got me some food um, and came back about five minutes later. And uh, she said, tuck in. And I was, you know, I just didn't know what to do. You know, I was hungry, but I didn't want to eat because I didn't know how to eat properly in front of royalty. But in fact, not only did Vincent Seabrook get money from the princess that night, but he tells us that in addition to that, she also took him to one of her charities, one of the hostels where people who are on the street are given aid. He spent some time there, and two and a half years later, two and a half years after meeting the princess, he's now got a job as a security job guard, that is, and his life is turned around. Tom, that's just one of the stories of people who have been touched by the princess. As Andrew corrected me, I think there are 500 representatives of the various charities who have been invited to march here. Um, she was unusual in her charitable work. It, 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 it's kind of the occupation of the royal family, but she chose charities that were not necessarily popular, and she chose charities in which she uh, immersed herself. Uh, there was an exchange of letters, apparently, between Prince Philip, her father-in-law, and Diana, in which he said, you know, it is the duty of the princess to be more than popular. And she wrote back and said, why can't we change some of these charities with which I'm involved? And she got involved in AIDS and homelessness and the anti-landmine movement around the world, went to Africa and held babies and did things that other members of that family had not done. They'd always been in charities that were kind of safer and from a distance. Yes, she chose her charities from her heart. She really did. And they gave her great joy. I mean, those were her greatest moments of happiness when she was involved with these things. When she, you know, and she could do things that frankly would repel other people you know she would hold the stump of a person with leprosy you know in uh, indonesia she would you know she was the first to really shake hands with the the aids victims and and, and, and take away that stigma and it gave her great strength and joy she loved doing it and she radiated when she did it she almost had a natural ability to reach out and comfort people she did have a natural ability she knew always the right thing to say to put people at ease she was willing to get down on the floor with children. She would chat about, you know, make small talk with people, old people in old folks' homes. I mean, she, she, she loved doing it. It was not a, it wasn't an act. It was a real, uh, it was an act, of course, in one level, but on the other level, it's deeply felt and um, seemed to be her real moments of achievement and happiness. In fact, some of the people wh whom she has helped in the past greatly resent the insinuation that somehow these were 
image enhancing yeah. photo opportunities, they say she did feel very, very deeply about what she was doing. She did. As the cortege makes its way now uh, through Hyde Park uh, and slowly winds its way toward Buckingham Palace, the official residence of the royal family, let's go to NBC's Jane Pauley, who is there now. Jane? Tom, I'm at Buckingham Palace with Robert Fox for introduction purposes, the chief foreign correspondent, the London Daily Telegraph, and historian who will join me all morning. We've seen some signs, Tom, of Rolls Royces pulling up in, uh, aside the uh, the east front of Buckingham Palace here. Robert Fox, we expect then to see the royal family adjoining or leaving for the Abbey or perhaps joining the cortege. What do you think? I think we're going to see a very elaborate and quite quick movement. The first thing will involve the symbol of this all, the standard, uh, the Queen's standard, the royal standard coming down. Which flies above uh, the which palace. Is, and as the Queen will depart with her party to Westminster Abbey, then we understand, and this will be quite dramatic, that uh, the three princes, Prince Charles and his sons, and Princess Diana's sons, Harry and William, and her brother, Earl Spencer, joining the cortege and following it solemnly down the mall in front of us through horse guards, where curiously they will go under the gaze of the statue of the last man, last person to be accorded anything like this, Earl Mountbatten, down into Whitehall, and then Parliament Square, Westminster Abbey. Tom, this all could be happening very shortly, so we'll keep you posted. All right, thank you very much, Jane Pauley. Let's go back to the cortege now. Momentarily, we do expect to see the members of the royal family. All right, uh, Jim Mikloszewski, you'll be hearing him but not seeing him. Jim, tell us about the mood where you are. Well, Tom, we're on South Carriage Driveway, and the gun carriage carrying Princess Diana is, is now passing. Uh, crowds have been lined up here at least 10 deep for some three to four hours, Tom. And, and then just before the procession began, the crowd swelled to at least, at least three times that, 25, 30, even 40 or 50 deep in some locations. And, and what's remarkable, Tom, uh, from our vantage point uh, up above South Carriage Drive, uh, the, the absolute stillness in the crowd. People have been standing in the same spot, absolutely silent, for several hours. And, and, and that silence is still all pervasive. And what's even more remarkable, behind the stationary lines of spectators as, and mourners, as they watch the cortege move past them very slowly, there is a mass migration of people just behind the lines as they make their way through Hyde Park following the cortege. All right, activity, uh, thank you very much, Jim Mikloszewski. Activity is beginning to pick up here at Westminster Abbey. Now, uh, a long line of men in dark suits and women, appropriately dressed, obviously, winding their way into this great and ancient church. Uh, members of the royal establishment, the, uh, of the political establishment, the royal family, uh, political leaders from around the world, friends of Diana's, including rock stars and movie stars. Branson is approaching down the street. It's young Phillips, I think, isn't it? Yes, here, uh, this is Richard Branson. Of, uh, you know him from Virgin Airways. Very popular figure in this country and a great friend of hers who helped the family apparently make the arrangements for the services. Uh, and he is well known as a uh, one of Britain's uh, most successful entrepreneurs with his airlines and his music stores and his records, parachuting, daredevil stunts, ballooning. And possibly also his political ambition. His name has been put forward as a future mayor of London. He's a wonderful combination of a sort of re renegade, you know, pop figure and, the, and a brilliant entrepreneur, and he manages to keep a foot in so many camps. He's a very entertaining. Cindy Crawford is arriving in Westminster Abbey. Uh, no, sorry, it's difficult to see. No, it's not. Although she's quite beautiful as well. Apparently, Cindy, Cindy Crawford. That's Who's Lady that? Annabelle Goldsmith, the wife of the widow of uh, Sir James Goldsmith, with his, um, with her daughter, his daughter as well, uh, Jemima Khan, the wife of Imran Khan, the Pakistan cricketer and uh, 
politician. Lady Annabel often used to have the princess to lunch uh, at the weekend. Uh, she has a very relaxed and sort of um, loose kind of a household where children come and go and dogs and, you know, all kinds of friends dropping in. And the princess used to love going there. Uh, and having lunch and, and doing the washing up afterwards with the family. It was where I met um, the princess and uh, one of the things we haven't mentioned, which I'm sure Tina wants to mention as well, is uh, in all of this talk of her uh, serious side and her philanthropy, she was also a very, very funny person, very witty, hilarious. The whole table would, uh, would roar with laughter when she was... Uh, when she was present. Yeah, she was very irreverent, and that's the, the, she, she went to that house to have fun. And she gave a lot of fun when she went. Apparently, she would sometimes even impersonate the queen yeah, in a, a, in a, a very mean, humorous She was a very way. mean mimic. <laughs> <laughs> A Texas businessman wrote in a paper yesterday about the first time that he met her and how excited he was, and she came through the line and knew exactly what to say to him. She said, how do you use that expression, y'all? And then he gave her a quick lesson on it, and she went on, and he said, I felt as if I'd spent hours with her. Uh, the horses uh, are from Ireland. Their uniformity and color is obvious to all of us who are watching here members of the British Army, these horses, and they were fed some extra rations last night to keep them alert. Anyone who's been around horses at all is uh, suitably impressed not only by the great look of these horses, but by their calmness and their own innate sense of dignity. They need to be strong as well, because it's 40 tons, the lead-lined coffin, so they have to be pretty um, pretty tough with... Uh, uh, sorry, 40 gun... stones, right? For, um, no, I mean the gun carriage as well. Oh, I see. And it had to to, uh, to have it pulled by uh, by those horses. They, those six horses have to be really tough. We tried to find some information about the coffin, and all we could find out was it was 40 stones, and it is lead lined, and that's about all we know. These are the representatives of the some of the 110 charities. charities. The youngest following the procession is five years old, a little girl with cancer. That's a wonderful touch, I think, uh, Tina, to have these people there. Yes, it's certainly something she would have wanted. Um, Former Prime Minister Heath. Deputy Prime Minister Prescott. I want to mention it's an absolutely gorgeous September day. Temperature is expected to be about 68. Rain expected a little bit later on today, but that's hard to believe given the blue skies that exist right now. Very much like the day of her wedding, Tina, which is a June day. I mean, it is so haunting in so many ways, you know, that uh, this very procession route uh, that we saw a different kind of joyous celebration at that time. Um, she was being introduced to the world and was captivating. A friend of Tina's by the name of Clark James has written in the special edition of The New Yorker said that it was like seeing her for the first time in person was like, like watching the sun come up. She had that kind of beauty. Yes, I mean, in fact, it's amazing, really, the way she's presided over two occasions, which have brought forth such an incredibly powerful show of emotionalism. The intense joy of that day and the intense grief of this day quite unprecedented. Tom Corby is an author and has written about the royal family. He joins us now to give us his perspective on this incredible event. An incredible event. I mean, she would have looked at this and said, is this for me? Um, I'm bowled over by it. I'm completely bowled over. I mean, beginning of the week, who would have thought that this response do you think the British people have even surprised themselves? I know I've read that in places. I think they have. Um, but I think a lot of people also 
maybe not grieving, but swept up by a great national occasion. And that's what it is. And that's what it's become. I think she, who was a lot more self-effacing than people imagine, would have preferred something quietly up in Northamptonshire, which is getting later on. But this, this, I've covered all Diana's engagements when I was a, a royal journalist. This is her last engagement. That's how I see it. And Incredible. You know, the fact is that in her public career, beginning, I think, with her marriage, um, we always underestimated her. Uh, yeah. I mean that in a collective way, uh, that, that people... That's that Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad Fayyad. Fayyad uh, who is the father of Dodi Fayyad, and he drove his son's black Range Rover here, we're told. He's been a controversial figure in this country for some time. He's been denied British citizenship and a passport. In the last 24 hours or so, the family's been very active in showing videotape from the hotel, from security cameras, talking about the relationship between the two, and personal details about an exchange of gifts. Um, the Dodi Fayed was buried immediately, obviously, because he's a Muslim. And, uh, his father has talked in the last oh, 20 hours or so about going to the morgue to see his son and said that he seemed to be at peace and to see Diana as well. And going to the Paris apartment and noting some of the gifts that Diana had in fact given Dodie a pair of cufflinks that had belonged to Earl Spencer, a gold cigar clipper with a tag inscribed from Diana with love. And apparently Dodie Fayed had written a poem and had it inscribed on a silver plaque and left it for her under her pillow. Luciano Pavarotti. Yes, he said he was uh, just simply too moved by her death to perform here today. Uh, and at first he wasn't even going to attend the funeral. No. Right. He seems uh, obviously terribly distraught. Let's go now to Buckingham Palace if we can. Jane Pauley is there and we're told cars are beginning to move, Jane. Well, as Robert Fox, who's with me now, said, the choreography seems to be beginning. There is much movement. What, what do you see happening and what do you expect? I expect um, the minor royals, so-called, immediate to the royal family, to start moving off for Westminster Abbey. And it's ironic, just as it will come down in the next Are few minutes, the standard is flying uh, at full extension now. It, it and became very quiet here all of a sudden. And I see people entering those automobiles they will be the ladies in waiting they will be uh, security officials and the cards are literally or soundlessly gliding out uh, and so the royal family is on its way to probably an unbelievably testing day testing in a way that none of them could have imagined when you say the minor royals will they lead the way and the the, the queen would follow they will go as the spencers will go just as a family closely involved. And that will be the role of Princess Andrew, Edward, uh, the Princess Royal, Princess Anne. They are just family mourners at the moment in this. We earlier saw the Rolls Royce that, that uh, bears the Queen's standard uh, enter the palace yard. So the, the Queen is, uh, is getting ready as well. Tom, I heard you talking about the wedding. And of course, I'm sitting pretty much exactly where you and I were sitting for the occasion of the royal wedding. And, Thinking of the, the, the role of the queen then as now is uh, somewhere behind uh, in terms of where the focus of the attention on today is uh, her former daughter-in-law. And Robert Fox was reminding me that it's interesting that the, the sovereign, the queen, is not today the chief mourner. No, she is just a family member in this. And it's interesting that the focus will be on the four, the four males and Lady Diana, as she will, to millions of our viewers still be, Lady Diana, Diana, Princess of Wales, two sisters, who have been incredibly moved, but I think that they have done a great deal. The, one of the, one of the uh, cars is leaving, and uh, I think it's Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, 
has gone out uh, on, on, on his own. Is it uh, likely that the procession will follow quickly? I think the, the, the rest will go, and then we will have what in military terms would be called, and they will cut, the, the, the escort will come under command of Captain uh, Richard Williams, a captain of the Prince of Wales Company of the Welsh Guards, and then the slow march of the cortege will take place uh, to Westminster Abbey itself, followed, as we now know, by the three princes Tom. and Charles Althorpe, Earl Spencer. Jane, we're, seeing, uh, mm -hmm. we're seeing Elton John come in now, and George Michael come in as well. Elton John will sing a song that he has rewritten, uh, and he said last night that they'd had a row, but that they'd been reunited, uh, Diana and Elton John, at the funeral for Versace, their common friends. Copies of the song will be sold throughout London, and the proceeds will go to the then, Princess then. Diana's uh, memorial fund that's been set up by Buckingham Palace. Apparently, her favorite Elton, song, Elton John song was your song, not Candle in the Wind, but somehow Candle in the Wind seems extremely appropriate. is making its way uh, into the heart of the crowd here. The crowd is everywhere, obviously. And, uh... Since we'll try to refrain from speaking during the actual service itself, Tom, maybe we should give people watching back in the States and for that matter all over the world some kind of idea of what will take place during that service. It'll be a traditional Anglican service with some uh, added attractions, obviously. Elton John will be singing. You'll hear uh, Tony Blair reading from uh, Corinthians. Uh, there will be readings as well by uh, Diana's two sisters. Um, and the hymns will be sung by the BBC choir. What you'll see is a traditional, not entirely high Anglican service here today, but one that has a kind of popular motif to it, wouldn't you agree, Andrew? It's an interesting mishmash, um, both uh, ecclesiastically and um, obviously socially, and um, in terms of the, of the music and the, and the hymns. A couple of the most uh, patriotic hymns we have, some of those patriotic music, Nimrod by Elgar, for example, and also, as you say, some, uh, some pop music. I don't think that uh, at, this, at this venerable church there's ever been uh, an assemblage quite like that. No, no, not quite. Well, well I mean, it did see the coronation of William the Conqueror in 1066, which was uh, quite an occasion. Uh, in fact, the beginning of British history, modern British history. I understand that, but you don't think the rock stars of the time came to attend? I, I'm sure. <laughs> it also saw the wedding of the Duchess of York. We're right, looking well, at pictures of Henry Kissinger, excuse me for interrupting, was, uh, along with his wife, Henry Kissinger, speaking very movingly of Diana. They were very close. Actually, she, she counted on him. Uh, he would see her whenever he came to London, and they would talk about uh, a lot of matters, both personal and political. That's Winston Churchill, the grandson of uh, the great prime minister. Son of Pamela Harriman, the ambassador yep. to Paris, who recently died also at the Ritz um, when she was swimming. He's just walking past the tomb of the unknown soldier. A British warrior is all it says. The bones of a man who fought in the First World War. We might want to point out as well, Tom, that family members have requested that their faces not be shot during the course of the service. So we will not be seeing, I think appropriately, the faces of Prince William and Prince Harry during the service, It'll but just the faces of those who will be speaking. It'll be difficult enough. Andrew Roberts, tell us again the significance of actually going through the Wellington Arch. Well, again, this is a massive break with precedent. Only sovereigns go through the Wellington Arch, and um, since it was built, nothing but that has, uh, has been the rule, and now a non-sovereign, indeed legally, in legal terms, a non-royal 
is going through. So, uh, so quite another break with precedent here. service they seem to be so far as we can tell generally uh, on schedule here these are plans that are under other circumstances are worked out with military precision they had only a week to work these out because there were no contingency plans as we have said repeatedly and there's the Prime Minister Tony Blair who has just taken office here a young man uh, older than Diana, but in a way, generation, generationally, he shared many of uh, her ideas, and uh, they had become close, Tina. Yes, uh, she found in him, um, you know, a compassionate and uh, communicative man who she could talk to about what she felt could be her role. She was dying for a role, something that she could do that would really help the country without her having to sort of, in a way, conduct her own sort of guerrilla missions to do things on her own. She wanted to really be of use, and she believed that uh, Tony Blair uh, sympathized with that position, and, and she, what she told him she wanted to be a sort of ambassador for the country and sent to trouble spots. That, uh, Tony Blair is downplaying this, Tom, but there's some speculation that a phone call to Balmoral Castle a 15-minute conversation he had with Prince Charles prompted the royal family to return to London a bit earlier than they had originally planned. Andrew, do you think that's true? No, that sounds like pure speculation to me. The, um, uh, the details will not be known for 30 years, the true details, and who can say what, uh, who said what to whom in a telephone conversation. Neither side are leaking. The actor Tam uh, Conti is coming in uh, behind Tony Blair as well, a confluence of her many interests once again, and we've commented on that on several occasions here. Tony Blair and his wife Sherry have been compared to Bill and Hillary Clinton, Tina Brown. Fair comparison? No, I think they're very unlike, really, actually. Um, I, don't, I don't think there is a great deal of resemblance between them. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, both Tony Blair and President Clinton are very brilliant and, and you know, their wives are, are, are women of great seriousness. But there isn't, I think they're more unalike than they are alike. Tony Blair once played in a rock band himself. I mean, uh, he, he was a young man who um, yeah, was very much of his time when he came up here, Mr. Attenborough. Lord Attenborough now. Yeah. Clive James, uh, the TV critic who often used to give the princess advice about television appearances. Um, he begged her not to do the BBC interview, as a matter of fact, but she took no notice of his advice. She was another one that, uh, he was another one that they had a close relationship and then they had a falling out and he wrote about that uh, this week, but he said that he was utterly entranced by her. He described their relationship as being in cahoots. When she went to Japan, she asked what she could do that would be special, and he suggested that she learn a few phrases in Japanese. And uh, that was enormously popular during her visit there when she, in fact, did, did just that. Reminds you of Jackie Kennedy speaking French on one of her official state visits. Buckingham Palace, we're told that uh, Queen Elizabeth is about to depart, and uh, there, in fact, we're seeing through the gates, uh, what we think, yes, yes, that's the departure of Queen, Queen Anne, and Princess Anne, I believe that's Princess Anne with her under the hat. You can see the, uh, the Queen, and I'll invite Robert Fox to join me in recognizing people. I see Prince Philip, I think, because he's Princess so tall. Royal, Princess Anne is there. It's the first time we've seen uh, much of her, but this is absolutely unprecedented that they're coming out on foot. to show themselves to the crowd on foot. It's a tremendous note of respect for Diana, amongst other things. Of course, we're looking for uh, 
Prince Charles. Yes, I've and seen him and, you the, have and, seen the, and the princes are there. They are at the front mm -hmm. and they are coming out to salute, to pay their respects to this cortege as it comes down Constitution Hill, which is, and it's on its way now. Well, this is absolutely... It, again, unprecedented. absolutely unprecedented. Never been seen before quite like this. And as we, no surprise, the, the focus today is on those two boys. Yes. And but they're standing, Jane, like an ordinary family at a gate. This may be a countryside, a rural funeral in any of the villages in England that Diana might have come from in Northamptonshire or whatever. They're just standing there as one of the families deeply involved in the grief of this terrible, terrible event. The crowd is uh, energized by this. Many, many cameras being raised over the heads of, of the crowd, but still it's it's very silent. Nobody is, is speaking. One ripple of applause and then silence. Quite astonishing. You wonder how those young boys were prepared uh, for this moment. Um, William is 15 years old, uh, which well, is somewhere between boy and man, but... Having two children who have just gone through that stage, it is just a terrible, terrible moment for boys and girls to, 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 to lose their mother. At that stage of life, it really is, it is so poignant, and it really is now the focus of, 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 of this procession. Really, what happens to the boys? Uh, it's what the Queen said, and she actually hit the right note with that. Th that's what the crowd have been talking about most of the morning. It's the boys, Diana and the boys now. Well, as Tina Brown was describing earlier, the criticism that the family stayed up in Balmoral too long, uh, neglecting the needs perhaps of, of her subjects, as Tina said, she was acting in her role as, as a grandmother, uh, which would strike me as perhaps exactly what these boys' mother might have hoped somebody would, would do, treat them as boys who need family. There's one word that drives the Queen's public life from the very beginning, from the war on, and it is duty. And whatever she did or didn't do, and this is where the criticism is unfair, in her own mind, the imperative would have been duty. Now, the thing is that they have broken with precedent. They are trying to be as warm and close to the boys as possible. They called in their nanny, extremely popular with them, Tiggy Legbrook, who's been, uh, who's, who, who's been uh, looking after them, comforting them since Tuesday. And she is going to be a very, very important uh, figure in their family life, in their intimate circle now. It's a little hard for me to see pictures. That was Princess Margaret, uh, I believe, next to the Queen. And uh, the Americans, of course, will recognize Sarah. Um, it is a great Stanley gathering Sarah Ferguson. in. For the can you, moment, can you all, help me, Robert, and, all and if we can adjust our is, monitor is, is, is and look? It, yes. The family group includes everybody because, as we know, Sarah, Duchess of York, was very, very close indeed uh, to Diana. And in fact, she said terribly sadly, I feel truly I have lost a sister this, th th this week. So thank goodness a lot of the bitterness, a lot of the venom that there has been in the past about the do's and don'ts of the royals and the breakups of their marriage is being forgotten today. Tom, we'll throw it back to you for the time being. I expect the cortege to be uh, coming down Constitution Hill anytime, so we'll be back here at this location at that moment. Thank you, Jane. We're at uh, Westminster Abbey. You're watching the uh, cortege now as it continues its procession and it is approaching very close to Buckingham Palace. Uh, this is wholly unexpected, and we can't only anticipate what may happen next here, Andrew. How do you mean what may happen next year? We, uh, this, can, this can't happen again. This, uh, until maybe uh, the, uh, the, the funeral of the Queen or the Queen Mother, we're not going to have anything, uh, anything like this. And even those might not uh, quite uh, equate. Not in popular appeal, unfortunately. I think it's interesting how as soon as the news of the death hit, people just moved instinctively to Buckingham Palace as if they felt they had to, to, had to be there, even though there was nobody home. And they waited simply as a gesture of solidarity. This obviously is a gesture to the public as well. They're coming out and standing and they're being so public and so exposed here and trying to, in some way, to show 
their association with this moment in this very public way. And I think a lot of them are thinking about their grandchildren, telling their grandchildren, and that's one of the reasons that they've brought uh, so many young children as well. I'm not sure it's a gesture to the public. I think it's a gesture to Diana, a public mark of respect for her. Now we're coming down, uh, Andrew, as you corrected me earlier, Constitution Hill, uh, and we'll be uh, approaching the uh, palace shortly. On the right-hand side, as she goes, are the beautiful and vast gardens of Buckingham Palace. You never really realize quite how big they are unless you fly over them. There's a huge herbaceous border over the wall. Beautiful herbaceous border. The Royal Standard is uh, still flying at uh, full staff. There have been some talk that it would go to half staff, which again would be uh, something completely unprecedented here. The Union Jack flag instead will fly at half staff when the Royal family leave. leave. Right. And it will fly half staff until midnight. That's right, That's yes. Correct. Expressions on those people's faces. Interesting sign. Of course, people wonder how stoic Prince William and Prince Harry will be. They were quite stoic yesterday they when they were. walked among the crowd. But did you notice the shadows under their eyes? Some of the largest cheers that we've had uh, here at Westminster Abbey as people uh, debus came for the Chelsea pensioners, who are the old veterans who fought in, uh, in wars yes. this century. Uh, they were, the Chelsea Hospital was set up in the reign of King Charles II, 300 years ago. Uh, back at Westminster Abbey, there's uh, some anticipation that uh, Hillary Clinton uh, is arriving. She is the uh, coming because of her strong personal association. And she's here uh, as a representative of the president of the American people as well. They did uh, share some very intimate chats at the White House and uh, a lot of common concerns about uh, children especially. Meeting for the and last AIDS. time in June at the White House when Princess Diana talked quite poignantly about her upcoming trip to Bosnia. They first met during the D-Day D -Day ceremonies, anniversary ceremonies. says he plans to watch the funeral Tom from his vacation spot at Martha's Vineyard, presumably with Chelsea as well. Jane Pauley at Buckingham Palace. Tom, the cortege is pa passing in front of the royal family even as we speak. The queen has for the first time uh, seen it pass along with Prince Charles and the princes Harry and William. It's passing in front of their eyes immediately, even as I speak. And the horses are at a very slow walk. Only the commanders of the escorts, I can see the busbies of the artillerymen of the King's Troop Royal Horse Art Artillery. The officers salute the Queen. But the Queen and the Royal Family are absolutely still. They are a family paying respect. And the reason I suspect that uh, the uh, pool camera is focusing on the uh, cortege bearing the coffin carrying Diana's body is that, is that the, the queen had asked the media to be as respectful as possible of, of privacy. Though there we have a, a shot of the queen, but not the boys. I think they were being very protective of Princess William and Harry. Well, um, we, are, we understand, Jane, at this very point that the princes and uh, Earl Spencer are going to 
join the procession. Earl Spencer being their uncle. The being their uh, uncle. Is, uh, Diana's and younger brother, Charles. The coffin is now passing right in front of us. It's going round uh, the Victoria Memorial outside uh, Buckingham Palace. We can see the trumpets of the white lilies and the white roses placed by the princes. Diana's sons. Robert, when I was here 16 years ago, sitting at this very place, watching Flowers a carriage flowing now, by Jane. and Diana a bride, what a different moment we're witnessing today. And the, the crowd is following, but it is absolutely silent. It is quite astonishing. Now, uh, the royal family is moving back uh, to board the cars. Now we were told. We were told that the princes were going to join it, but I don't see them walking past our position. They may join the procession later on as it gets towards the end of the mile. It is now entering the mile. If the Royal joined Avenue the is in the procession now, Robert, how long a walk would that have been? That might have been excruciating. I think it would be, would the rate it's going, it's about, about 25 minutes minimum. So maybe it's not likely that they would have marched the whole way. No. There's something astonishing happening, that somebody spontaneously in the crowd is playing a bagpipe lament. It is very, very strange. In 30 years of journalism and covering public events in Britain, I've never seen anything like this. I'm told that um, you can maybe make out an envelope atop the casket looks like maybe it's propped up on the flowers near the near the front and it's addressed to mummy to mummy tom as the cortege as you say is around the queen victoria monument and begins its long and final journey to Westminster Abbey. there was that memorable speech by Queen Elizabeth in which she described it as the year having been an annus horribilis. Andrew and Fergie were separated. Anne and Mark Phillips were divorced. Diana and her true story was published. There was a fire at Windsor Castle. That was five years ago. We can only imagine what she must be thinking about this year. coming out of, uh, I think this is St. James is preparing to join behind the cortege. It's Charles, William and Harry, Earl Spencer. Prince Philip is there as well. Andrew Roberts, this is a very brave move on the part of the princess, is it not? It's the endearing image, just as you had uh, with JFK's funeral, that uh, picture of the young JFK Jr. saluting his father's coffin. This is, I think, what people will remember of this funeral. Certainly the most heartbreaking sight. And this is what they wanted, those two boys. They would have personally requested this after seeing their, their mother's coffin on Friday. Prince Charles has been, as the Princess of Wales was, absolutely adamant that they must always choose. They would not have pressure put on them as, as he did when he was young. They would choose. And as Andrew said, this would have been their decision and theirs alone. Bringing up the children was the one thing that the prince and princess never argued over. They were united on that. Part 
European royal. You have to do these things. The younger boys with their hands clasped in front of them. Earl Spencer and Prince Charles in the traditional male posture of the royal family, their hands clasped behind them. Close to uh, their uncle, Earl Spencer, Lord Nelson, do you know? Quite close. Um, you know, he lives in Cape Town now, so not as close as they might have been if he'd stayed here. Um, they're much closer to Peter Phillips, who is the son of um, Princess Anne, who's about 19 now. And, that, and a big athletic star in this country. And a big athletic star, and he's someone they, they really like. of Diana's favorite charities. So this will be an unusual, this will be an unusual uh, procession, to say the very least. Uh, you will have representatives of the homeless, AIDS organizations, and other organizations with which she was closely identified, marching just behind the former husband, her sons, and her brother. A rich mix of the many parts of her life, personal and otherwise. It must be a huge solace to her sons to see how much the public loved her. Uh, you know, there have been so much controversy surrounding their mother, really, that now they have a very clear picture that she was adored. At the same time, Tina, don't you think it might be a bit overwhelming for them? I almost felt sorry for them as the throngs of people reached out to them yesterday as they walked among the crowd. I think it must be very, very confusing. I mean, you know, one minute she's, you know, a sort of rock star, the next minute she's a saint. The next, you know, they saw her as, as, as their mother who was always there for them. And uh, all these roles colliding, it's a lot for these young boys to be dealing with. Tom, all week long, people have been commenting on the striking resemblance between Diana and her eldest son, Prince William, even the manner where he sort of shyly put his, his head, head down. This might be a moment to recall the lines of the great British poet Auden. Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone, silence the pianos, and with muffled drum, bring on the coffin, let the mourners come.
Stratton Road in London, so many intersections of life all coming together. Behind the casket bearing the body of the beautiful 36-year-old princess who had created an extra form of royalty, not only in this country, but around the world. Described in the last 24 hours or so by the Catholic Archbishop of Westminster as being like all of us, flawed, but lovable. Lovable to a degree that not even she could have appreciated in her wildest imagination. She reminds me of the description that Jane Austen gave to her heroine Emma, faultless in spite of all her faults. Somewhat a surprise that Prince Philip has joined in. He married the Queen in 1947. He is 76 years old. Yeah. Tom Corby, are you surprised to see him there? Totally surprised. Um, an unexpected um, arrival, but they're a gesture of solidarity. He, uh, they've just celebrated their golden wedding anniversary. November. Right. November. Right. In this very church in right. November. I remember vividly when they were married, that was another event that uh, resonated around the world. I was yeah, a, we had a day off school. Right, a child <laughs> at the time. The, uh, he had uh, not the best relationship with her. They had an exchange of letters from time to time, and uh, she had a whole different idea of royalty than he did. Well, he's, he's an old-fashioned type of royal, and she was the new, mo new, new type of royal. But he did some pretty radical things when he arrived, too a lot of people when they arrived, overturned all sorts of things. We're going to go to uh, back to Westminster now. I think we're about to see the sisters uh, arriving of Diana. They will be participating in the ceremonies today as well. It's Lady Sarah McCorkadale and Lady Jane Fellows. Interesting, interestingly enough, Tom, Sarah dated Prince Charles and he was visiting Althorpe back in 1977 for a shooting yeah. party, visiting yeah. Sarah. And at that point, he met Diana. She was, was snared by the younger sister, I guess. She was 17 at the time. In a field. In a plowed field. Mm. This is Tom Kidd, the mother of Princess Diana. The one who uh, left the family uh, when she was just six to marry a Scottish cattleman. Very handsome woman. You can see where the Diana genes are. She lives in Scotland now, but I understand, Tina, they do or did have a fairly close relationship, is that correct? Yes, she always was always the first person that the princess phoned when she came back from abroad. Um, Mrs. Shankill has become very religious recently, and she's a very devout Catholic. Um, she lives in deepest Scotland, uh, the Hebrides, on, on an island. In a novelty shop, she runs with her husband. Exactly 12 years younger than her husband when she married him. The same age difference as between Diana and Charles in this very church. It was the wedding of the year. And in fact, I understand for that reason, since they did get divorced, Diana considered Westminster Abbey a bit of a bad luck venue. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. I think it was Charles who wanted some Pauls. Also, St. Paul's fits an extra thousand people. That's another important uh, consideration when you're bringing along ambassadors and foreign St. Paul's was where Winston Churchill's yeah. funeral was that's, held. That's well. correct, yes. Wasn't it the last state funeral? Those poor kids. Charles get to be king? Well, it'll be a very short reign because the queen is um, constitutionally very, very strong, very healthy lady. 
Um, he wants to be king. He feels he's been trained to be king. It's his destiny. He could make a very good king. My view. Diana didn't think so, though, did she, Tina? No, she said so, but in my opinion, she might well have changed her mind uh, had she lived. Um, he, could have, he could make a very thoughtful and uh, sensitive king. Um, he does care uh, in his own way. She, she was rather wistful when she talked about him during your lunch, Tina, said they, saying they would have made a great team. She could have been shaking hands till the cows came home. Yeah, she regretted very much that they were not able to operate as that, and I think she was right. I think that uh, together they would have been unstoppable if they could only have worked it out. There are all the signs that they would have been unstoppable. He does tremendous work. He's a very complex uh, personality, yeah. sometimes quite a tortured personality, yeah. but it's a fascinating personality, and one, especially with his work with architecture and the Prince's Trust, and uh, so many other things. He's going to make a great king. You talk to any kid that he... That's uh, the Queen now. We're told the Queen Mother is leaving Buckingham Palace now, who will be uh, coming separately. Uh, she is a formidable force, obviously, in this country, and has been witness to so much triumph and tragedy in her own lifetime. One of her earliest memories was when she was only about eight years old, but she went in amongst the crowd at Buckingham Palace to watch the Victory in Europe celebrations in May 1945. She and Diana were once very, very close, but their relationship was became quite strained. Well, as a mother, obviously, her, uh, her first instincts, her first loyalties must be to her son. And uh, so when that started to go wrong, of course, she was drawn in that direction. I think there was um, an ambiguous relationship with Diana the last couple of years. But as she said yesterday, she respected her and admired her work. You can't help but respect and admire what Diana did. You're only going to watch her operating. It's a very, very moving sight. very much admired um, the Queen's professionalism at all times and strove to emulate her. You know, she saw how the Queen, even in the deepest heat, would, would have her bag and her pearls and her air that you know, nothing could ruffle her and she felt she wanted to be as professional as, as her and she, and she was and I think the Queen did admire that in her, that she performed her job so brilliantly. Prince Michael of Kent, um, Lord Frederick Windsor, Lady Gabriella Windsor, Princess Michael. Lord Frederick's just about to go up to Cambridge and the uh, princess told me how proud she was of that. He got there very much on his own intellect rather than through any connections. An Eton boy. Another Etonian just like uh, Prince William. There seemed to be a belief that uh, Prince William will find sanctuary at Eton, which is yes, a so great they, traditional school. For they, have, they haven't been protective of him, but they, 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 they've looked after him. Um, Harry has been much protected at Ludgrove. He has a splendid housemaster at Eton called yes, Andrew Gailey, who uh, is, is probably one of the, one of the finest uh, um, schoolmasters in Britain. And he's doing really well. I just hope this man put him back. Already he's missing term for all yeah. of this, of course, so it will set him back academically. Uh, he to was some to have started school last Wednesday. week. Mm -hmm. On Wednesday, yes. He'll also make a very good king. A friend of Diana's described William to me as a typical inky-fingered Eton boy, <laughs> and she met that in the nicest way. In other words, he was just another student there. He's, multi, he's very multi-talented. He paints and he does 
does things with metal, and um, he's also an academic. He's also quite athletic. Excellent. And athletic, too, yeah. Soccer player and, and an excellent hockey. swimmer, we're told. Yeah, he's a wet bob. That's the expression. His best friend is, in fact, the son of his father's best friend, Nicholas Soames, and uh, who's at Eaton with him. I think that there's a lot of concern about security here, but the crowd is uh, extraordinarily well behaved, not that you would expect it to be any other way. Respectful, uh, it's been devoted to the idea of grieving publicly for Diana in the streets for a long, long time. Uh, quiet as the cortege passes by. There were some strong expressions earlier in the week about Prince Charles and the royal family. None of that is being heard publicly for today, as you would not expect. In some way, it was almost uh, fortuitous that this terrible tragedy happened at a time when the royal family were all together in Balmoral, because it did enable them to have a time together of healing. Normally, they would have been in different parts of the globe. We're um, turning into Parliament Street to the passage of the horse guards here, I think. Is that where we are now? Yes, it has that's, that's the horse guards arch. Right. Horse guards was where the um, British Army was, uh, was run from, really from the 16th century onwards. It's uh, been the heart of the officer corps of the British Army and the Queen's personal guard. And it is also the, believe it or not, the official entrance to Buckingham Palace or to the Court of St. James. As each car comes up, they're getting a sort of popularity oh, clap. But, uh, that's, yeah. so, that's so poignant. Jane, Sorry to interrupt Jane you. Holly uh, mentioned that earlier. There's a car that says mummy. I recall what Princess Diana wrote on her father's wreath five years ago. Um, I think he said only five years ago since I covered that funeral. To darling daddy, I will love you always. Diana, yeah, five years later. She felt that he was really almost the best member of the royal family. She admired all his good works and thought he didn't get enough attention, that he was underrated, as well as Princess Anne. Yes, yeah, she, she felt that their work was not paid enough attention to and that almost too much was paid to her own. She had an innate modesty, actually. He's a real star in the family. I mean, he was a military hero, uh, Andrew. Oh, the Falklands, yeah. Right? yeah. He, he was a helicopter fighter, right. yeah. pilot during the Falklands War. Very perilous duty, he indeed. He certainly diced with death one or two times. See how he holds the hand of the girls? I mean, he still loves his daughters, obviously he does, and I think he loves his wife, too. They have quite a friendly relationship. Don't very, they? very good relationship, yeah. apparently, yes. Which is extraordinary considering all the uh, things that they've gone through together. The Queen now has left the Buckingham Palace, and we're just going to watch here for a few moments as the family, the mourners gather at Westminster Abbey from around the world, and the cortege now makes its final approach to this ancient abbey. It's a little older than a thousand years old. Um, they think 7th century was the first time that the Saxons built a place of worship here. Edward the Confessor, wasn't it? Edward so. the Confessor was 300 years later, and uh, yes, he was... Um, when it was a Benedictine monastery? It, yeah. It was, yes. And Hyde Park was part of its grounds. The flag, here we go. Now we 
you see the uh, Union Jack and Half Staff of Buckingham Palace where Jane Pauley is located, Jane. We've been waiting for this. The crowd just applauded. I'm sitting with uh, Andrew Neal, the editor-in-chief of the European, uh, was formerly editor of the Sunday Times. Sunday Times of London. And you, an anti-royalist, have been very anxious to watch that. What did you tell me? It was people power? There are people, when that flag went up, the people applauded because the people had done that. If it had been left to the House of Windsor, you wouldn't be seeing that flag right now. The people put that flag there. To an American audience, to see a, a nation's flag at half-mast, this is not a remarkable sight, but above Buckingham Palace in a thousand years, that has never happened. That has never happened in the history of the British monarchy, which, as you say, is a thousand years. Tradition has always been that the Queen's flag or the King's flag flies, never at half-mast, represents the continuity of the nation, whoever lives or dies. That's protocol. Protocol doesn't matter with these people. This is uh, the people's princess, uh, these same people are about to try to turn this into a people's monarchy. You're an, an anti-royalist. No, I'm anti the House of Windsor. That's a different thing. Ah, I and think the behavior of the House of Windsor, it's not really the day to dwell on this, but I think over the past 10 years, and particularly the treatment of Diana, have made reluctant Republicans of many British people. But aren't you in a mood for reconciliation yourself after this extraordinary week? I think that the, uh, the Queen's broadcast last night, live, expressing emotions we've never heard from a British monarch, maybe not exceptional for an American president, but for a British monarch, very much so. I think this, if they can learn the lessons of this and learn the lessons of Diana, they might begin a new relationship with the British people. All right. Thank you. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Jane. Well, that's a dialogue that has been going on throughout this country and will continue, no doubt. Uh, very strong feelings on both sides of the issue. You just saw passing by uh, Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mother, uh, who are now approaching Westminster Abbey. They just came past the Cenotaph, which is the main war memorial built by Sir Edwin Lutyens after the First World War and uh, commemorating those who died in the second as well. This is her Majesty. This place obviously has such rich meaning for Queen Elizabeth. It was here that uh, she had her coronation in 1952 when she was a young and beautiful princess at the time who was on safari in Africa when her father died. And she returned immediately because she was the queen. Every single coronation, apart from two, have been held here at uh, Buckingham Palace. The two exceptions being those of Edward V and Edward VIII, who, of course, was never crowned. 39 altogether, I gather, the, the yes. sovereigns were uh, coronation too. It's so much different now. When, during her coronation, I remember the movie reels, you know, black and white, took days to get back to the theaters and the people could watch them, but they poured into the theaters to watch it then. Uh, and even in occupied Berlin, um, one cinema was standing, it was packed every night. Right. Incredible thing, that wedding. I mean, we, 1947, rationing, fuel crisis, everyone freezing. It's a splash of color in our rather dreary lives. She's on her stick, but she's walking. Also, and when she went by the tomb of the unknown soldier or warrior, she placed her wedding bouquet on that, and that set her style. 
She was probably the most liked princess of Wales to anyone in the royal family in her extraordinarily uh, communicative gifts, the way she had always the right gesture at the right time. Exactly. Her famous line was something like, my, don't the flowers look lovely? Didn't she say that at almost every occasion? She was a, yeah, she's a great flower lady. But um, she was um, a wonderful queen consort. I remember when she went, I don't remember, but she went to France uh, uh, to build up her relations with France just before the First World War. And she laid a single red poppy on a war memorial. And Hitler was watching um, this in Berlin. And he turned around and said, that is the most dangerous woman in Europe. Of course, she was the queen of the Blitz. She was also crowned here, of course, with yes. her husband, at least her husband was crowned here, in May 1937. They stayed here during the Blitz, and then they, yep. would, and they would walk out immediately after the bombing had stopped and uh, walk right. among the people. And when Buckingham Palace was, was hit by uh, bombs in September 1940, she said, uh, now at last I can look the East End in the face. That's right. And she went back there um, in her 90th birthday year, visit all the sites that she used to visit. I once asked her how it, what it felt like to be a queen empress, because of course she was the last one. She said it felt very nice while it lasted. <laughs> it didn't last very long. <laughs> Sadly not. But when she used to go and visit the bomb sites, um, there was some unctuous official who complained about wearing her powder blue and her bits of feather. She used to be all feathers and frills when she was young. And um, in her high heels, they said, well, why don't you wear something more suitable for the aftermath of an air raid? And she turned around, she fixed him with her eyes and said, um, oh, they'd wear their best dresses if they were coming to see me. <laughs> so after that, <laughs> she was another unstoppable. I have to think there was a great, um, a great similarity between her and Diana. Well, she had some of her gaiety, didn't she? Yeah, she some of her gaiety. Um, her gift of communication, I think, was her team. She's a remarkable woman. And a connection with the past, um, unlike any other. Uh, during the services, the uh, presiding will be the most reverend and right honorable Dr. George Carey, who is the Lord Archbishop of Canterbury, the primate of all England. He'll lead the prayers, and I, he's the one who greeted uh, the Queen Mother when she arrived. The music we'll hear during the service was selected by Diana's sisters, Jane and Sarah. Some of her favorite pieces of music will be played, including the very traditional English hymn, Vow to Be My Country, which was also sung at her wedding. That will be a very emotional moment. Uh, it's one of the uh, great tear-jerking hymns of the English canon. Roberts, the Spencer family, particularly Earl Spencer, play, played quite a pivotal role in the planning of this occasion, didn't he? He overruled the palace and disinvited or said that tabloid editors would not be welcome here? Certain tabloid ed ed editors did have their invitations withdrawn. I don't know it's a question of overall the palace. I think it's probably a decision that went down rather well uh, with the palace. But there's a 25-man committee um, of the Lord Chamberlains who's been organizing a lot of this. And so the, uh, it was really them that he overruled. He, um, as the closest member of the family, has, and indeed the head of the Spencer family, he um, had automatically a great right to be consulted in every possible detail of the funeral. Do you find it surprising that Prince Charles will not be speaking? Not really. He is, after all, an ex-husband, uh, not the brother of the, uh, of the person that all this is all about. We want to... Uh... As the cortege approaches Westminster, we want to go to our colleagues now. Uh, let's begin with Jody Appleby. Uh, Jody Appleby, who's just down in among the crowd here at uh, Westminster Abbey. 
Jody. Tom, the scene here in front of Westminster Abbey has changed considerably in the last half hour or so. The crowd has gotten so much thicker. In fact, there's a line of policemen behind me holding back the hundreds of people that we see just, just since I turned around in the last 10 seconds, coming apparently from Kensington Palace. Uh, it seems that a lot of people have decided to follow the cortege in their own way on foot on side streets and the crowd here just struggling to get a glimpse of, of Princess Diana's casket as we expect it to come by here any moment now. People have clung to lamp posts. There are women sitting on their husband's shoulders, little girls sitting on their father's shoulders. A family of 11 from Kent admitted to me that they swiped some milk crates from a grocery store so that they could stand here Jody. and get a glimpse of the funeral procession. Tom? We're going to now watch as the cortege arrives at Westminster. The gun carriage, the Welsh guards, the children, the former husband, her father-in-law, and her brother immediately behind. Ted Hughes, a poet laureate who chronicles Britain's royal family, has written a special poem for this occasion. Ted Hughes, the poet laureate of the royal family, has written a special poem for this occasion. Mankind is many rivers that only want to run. Holy tragedy and loss makes the many one. Mankind is a holy, crowned mother and her son. For worship, for mourning, God is here, is gone. Love is broken on the cross, the flower on the gun.
who said that she wanted to be queen in the hearts of the people has achieved that status here today. We'll be joined during the course of this uh, service by Flora Winfield, Reverend Flora Winfield, priest in the Anglican Church. She'll be uh, helping us through the service, but uh, I'll say at the outset, we're gonna let the service unfold on its own. It is a mixture of traditional Anglican literature and services and then some added personal touches obviously. Flora Winfield, uh, as you look at the service, is this is something that uh, is quite unlike anything you've seen before, or is it uh, usual these days for the services to be combined with the personal wishes of the family and reflecting the life of the, of the person who is? Well, obviously, this is not a typical Church of England funeral service, but I think there's been a real attempt sensitively to combine um, some sense of Princess Diana's personality her vitality, her sense of love and uh, the fact that she minded so passionately about those who are marginalised with the, the traditions of the Church of England, which is of course one of the family of Episcopal churches, uh, like the Episcopalian Church in, in North America, which in a sense holds the grief of those who are bereaved. So that the dignity of the service in its traditional elements is as important to their grieving as the more personal parts, because it, it encapsulates and sums up 
the traditions of the Christian faith as they're offered in comfort to those who've lost someone very dear to them. And of course, at this service, we're mourning not only someone who is dear to a small group of people in a, in a family, but to an entire nation. So it's a very unusual service, but it also contains elements of the Anglican tradition which have an important part to play.
Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip laying flowers at the base of the casket, followed by Prince Charles, young Harry, and William. You'll see more in the Anglican Church in this country a making of the cross than you will in the Episcopal Church in America. They may confuse some of you. We are them. gathered here in Westminster Abbey to give thanks for the life of Diana, Princess of Wales, to commend her soul to Almighty God and to seek his comfort for all who mourn. We particularly pray for God's restoring peace and loving presence with her children, the Princes William and Harry, and all her family. In her life, Diana profoundly influenced this nation and the world. Although a princess, although a princess, she was someone for she was someone for whom, from afar, we dared to feel affection by whom and by whom we were all intrigued. She kept company with kings and queens, with princes and presidents. But especially we remember her humane concerns and how she met individuals and made them feel significant. In her death, she commands the sympathy of millions. Whatever our beliefs and faith, let us with thanksgiving remember her life and enjoyment of it. Let us rededicate to God the work of those many charities that she supported. Let us commit ourselves anew to caring for others and let us offer to him and for his service our own mortality and vulnerability. This is one of Diana's favorite hymns. It's a hymn which has tremendous significance for people in this country, not just because it speaks about our national pride, but because in the second verse it looks to our home in heaven above. Diana's sister, Lady if Sarah McCorkadale. If I McCorkadale. should die and leave you here a while, 
be not like others, sore undone, who keep long vigils by the silent dust, and weep. For my sake, turn again to life and smile, nerving thy heart and trembling hand to do something to comfort other hearts than thine. Complete these dear unfinished tasks of mine, and I, perchance, may therein comfort you.
Lynn Dawson, the soprano from The Requiem by Verde. This is Lady Jane Fellows doing a reading by Henry Van Dyke, an American clergyman who died in 1933, Princess Diana's other sister. Time is too slow for those who wait, too swift for those who fear, too long for those who grieve, too short for those who rejoice, but for those who love, time is eternity. of the 23rd Psalm, of course the psalm that's very often chosen for singing at funeral services. A, a version of the hymn which came very close to the hearts of the British people because it was sung at the wedding of our present Queen, the 23rd Psalm. It speaks of God's comfort to us and of our confidence in him leading us to green pastures through all the deep waters of death.
though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not, love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Princess Diana is friend the British Prime Minister reading 1 Corinthians 13. Now her other friend Elton John. Goodbye, Rose. Rose. May you well grow in our hearts. You are the grace that placed yourselves where lives were torn apart. You called out to our country and you whispered to those stars spell out your name and it seems to me you lived your life like a candle in the wind never fading with the sunset when the rain set in and your footsteps will always fall here along England's greenest hills your candles burned out long before your legend ever will loveliness we've lost those empty days without your smile this torch will for our nation's golden child Even though we try The truth brings us to tears All our words cannot express The joy you brought us 
through the years And it seems to me You've lived your life Like a candle in the wind Never fading with the sunset When the rain set in And your footsteps will always follow you Along England's greenest hills Your candles burned out your legend ever will Goodbye, Angel's Rose May you ever grow in our hearts You were the greatest place to set torn apart and Goodbye in this road from a country lost without your soul who missed the wings of your compassion more than you will ever know And it seems to me you've lived your life like a candle in the wind Never fading with the sunset when the rain set in and your footsteps will always fall here along England's greenest hills your candles burned out long before your legend ever will The applause that you hear is outside of Westminster Abbey, obviously. Um, people are hearing that and responding to Elton John, a friend of hers, and one of the most popular performers in this country. It's the first spontaneous outburst that we've had during the course of the service. It's almost as if the street is an extension of the church, Tom. It's been so quiet here. Earl Spencer, her brother, with a tribute. I stand before you today the representative of a family in grief, in a country in mourning, before a world in shock. We are all united, not only in our desire to pay our respects to Diana, but rather in our need to do so. For such was her extraordinary appeal that the tens of millions of people taking part in this service all over the world, via television and radio, who never actually met her, feel that they too lost someone close to them in the early hours of Sunday morning. It is a more remarkable tribute to Diana than I can ever hope to offer her today. Diana was the very essence of compassion, of duty, of style, of beauty. All over the world, she was a symbol of selfless humanity, a standard bearer for the rights of the truly downtrodden, a very British girl who's who transcended nationality someone with a natural nobility who was classless and who proved in the last year that she needed no royal title to continue to generate her particular brand of magic. Today is our chance to say thank you for the way you brightened our lives, even though God granted you but half a life. We will all feel cheated, always, if you were taken from us so young. And yet we must learn to be grateful that you came along at all, only now you are gone do we truly appreciate what we are now without. And we want you to know that life without you is very, very difficult. We have all despaired at our loss over the past week. And only the strength of the message you gave us through your years of giving has afforded us the strength to move forward. There is a temptation to rush to canonize your memory. There is no need to do so. You stand tall enough as a human being of unique qualities, not to need to be seen as a saint. Indeed, to sanctify your memory would be to miss out on the very core of your being, your wonderfully mischievous sense of humor with a laugh that bent you double, your joy for life transmitted wherever you took your smile and the sparkle in those unforgettable eyes, your boundless energy which you could barely contain. 
But your greatest gift was your intuition, and it was a gift you used wisely. This is what underpinned all your other wonderful attributes. And if we look to analyze what it was about you that had such a wide appeal, we find it in your instinctive feel for what was really important in all our lives. Without your God-given sensitivity, we would be immersed in greater ignorance at the anguish of AIDS and HIV sufferers, the plight of the homeless, the isolation of lepers, the random destruction of landmines. Diana explained to me once that it was her innermost feelings of suffering that made it possible for her to connect with her constituency of the rejected. And here we come to another truth about her. For all the status, the glamour, the applause, Diana remained throughout a very insecure person at heart, almost childlike in her desire to do good for others so she could release herself from deep feelings of unworthiness of which her eating disorders were merely a symptom. The world sensed this part of her character and cherished her for her vulnerability whilst admiring her for her honesty. The last time I saw Diana was on July the 1st, her birthday in London, when typically she was not taking time to celebrate her special day with friends, but was guest of honor at a fundraising charity evening. She sparkled, of course, but I would rather cherish the days I spent with her in March when she came to visit me and my children in our home in South Africa. I am proud of the fact that Apart from when she was on public display meeting President Mandela, we managed to contrive to stop the ever-present paparazzi from getting a single picture of her. That meant a lot to her. These were days I will always treasure. It was as if we had been transported back to our childhood when we spent such an enormous amount of time together, the two youngest in the family. Fundamentally, she hadn't changed at all from the big sister who mothered me as a baby, fought with me at school, and endured those long train journeys between our parents' homes with me at weekends. It is a tribute to her level-headedness and strength that despite the most bizarre life imaginable after her childhood, she remained intact, true to herself. There is no doubt that she was looking for a new direction in her life at this time, she talked endlessly of getting away from England, mainly because of the treatment that she received at the hands of the newspapers. I don't think she ever understood why her genuinely good intentions were sneered at by the media, why there appeared to be a permanent quest on their behalf to bring her down. It is baffling. My own and only explanation is that genuine goodness is threatening to those at the opposite end of the moral spectrum. It is a point to remember that of all the ironies about Diana, perhaps the greatest was this. A girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was, in the end, the most hunted person of the modern age. She would want us today to pledge ourselves to protecting her beloved boys, William and Harry, from a similar fate. And I do this here, Diana, on your behalf. We will not allow them to suffer the anguish that used regularly to drive you to tearful despair. And beyond that, on behalf of your mother and sisters, I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you are steering these two exceptional young men, so that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. We fully respect the heritage into which they have both been born, and will always respect and encourage them in their royal role. But we, like you, recognize the need for them to experience as many different aspects of life as possible, to arm them spiritually and emotionally for the years ahead. I know you would have expected nothing less from us. William and Harry, we all care desperately for you today. We are all chewed up with sadness at the loss of a woman who wasn't even our mother, how great your suffering is, we cannot even imagine. I would like to end by thanking God for the small mercies he's shown us at this dreadful time, for taking Diana at her most beautiful and radiant, and when she had joy in her private life. 
Above all, we give thanks for the life of a woman. I'm so proud to be able to call my sister the unique, the complex, the extraordinary and irreplaceable Diana, whose beauty, both internal and external, will never be extinguished from our minds. Earl Spencer, the brother of Diana, in a tribute that it was at once touching, loving, angry, emotional, and challenging. Challenging the royal family, challenging the press, challenging the world on his sister's behalf. And her legacy saying, do not sanctify her memory, do not canonize her in advance. The applause that you hear is the applause from people outside Westminster in various places. They have broken into applause on several occasions. They're hearing all of this. Did not likely see the likes of that again anywhere. As we approach the end of the services, we'll be hearing from the Most Reverend and Right Honorable Dr. George Carey, who is the Lord Archbishop of Canterbury. We give thanks to God for Diana, Princess of Wales, for her sense of joy, and for the way she gave so much to so many people. Lord, we thank you for Diana, whose life touched us all, and for all those memories of her that we treasure. We give thanks for those qualities and strength that endeared her to us, for her vulnerability, for her radiant and vibrant personality, for her ability to communicate warmth and compassion, for her ringing laugh, 
and above all for her readiness to identify with those less fortunate in our nation and the world. Lord of the loving, hear our prayer. We pray for those most closely affected by her death, for Prince William and Prince Harry, who mourn the passing of their dearly loved mother, for her family, especially for her mother, her brother, and her sisters. Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of family life, for all human relationships and for the strength we draw from one another. Have compassion on those for whom this parting brings particular pain and the deepest sense of loss. Casting their cares on you, may they know the gentleness of your presence and the consolation of your love. Lord, of the bereaved, hear our prayer. We pray for the members of the royal family, for wisdom and discernment as they discharge their responsibilities in the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth, and the world. Lord, we commend to you Elizabeth, our Queen, the members of the royal family, and all who exercise power and authority in our nation. Enrich them with your grace, that we may be governed with wisdom and godliness, so that in love for you and service to each other, we may each bring our gifts to serve the common good. Lord of the nations, hear our prayer. Diana was not alone in losing her young life tragically. We remember to her friend Dodie Fired and his family, Henri Paul, and all for whom today's service rekindles memories of grief untimely born. Lord, in certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, we commend to you all who have lost loved ones in tragic circumstances. Give them comfort, renew their faith, and strengthen them in the weeks and months ahead. Lord of the brokenhearted, hear our prayer. The princess will be especially missed by the many charities with which she identified herself. We recall those precious images, the affectionate cuddle of children in hospital, her relationship with Mother Teresa, whose death we also remember today, that touch of the young man dying of AIDS, her compassion for those maimed through the evil of landmines, and many, many, many more. Lord, we pray for all who are weak, poor, and powerless in this country and throughout the world. The sick, among them Trevor Rhys-Jones, the maimed, and all whose lives are damaged. We thank you for the way that Diana became a beacon of hope and a source of strength for so many. We commend to you all those charities that she supported. Strengthen the resolve of those who work for them to continue the good work begun with her. Lord of the suffering, hear our prayer. And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. As we reflect on the princess's compassion for others, 
We pray that we too may be inspired to serve as she served. Lord, we thank you for Diana's commitment to others. Give us the same compassion and commitment. Give us a steadfast heart, which no unworthy thought can drag down, an unconquered heart, which no tribulation can wear out, an upright heart, which no unworthy purpose can tempt aside. Grant us, O Lord, understanding to know you, diligence to seek you, wisdom to find you, and a faithfulness that may bring us to your eternal kingdom. Lord of the compassionate, hear our prayer. Therefore, confident in the love and mercy of God, holding a living faith in God's mighty resurrection power, we, the congregation here, those in the streets outside, and the millions around the world, join one another and the hosts of heaven as we say together in whatever language we may choose the prayer which Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all you love, now and forevermore. Amen. We are approaching the uh, conclusion of the services, and at that time there will be a one minute of silence. We are joined here by Reverend Flora Winfield.
This hymn has been chosen because it has particular significance for the people of Wales. It's almost a national anthem for the people of Wales and stands alongside the song Land of My Fathers. It's the kind of hymn that makes everyone in Wales want to stand up and shed a tear of pride. In terms of the national interest of Great Britain, it has been an ecumenical service. We heard uh, Irish music, obviously, uh, ancient traditional music, Elton John. That's and right. Also, the great English national anthem type hymn, I'm to be my country, at right. the beginning as well. And we began with, of course, God Save the Queen. And I believe the Highland Laments are also going to be played in various um, parts of the uh, service later on as well. Let us commend our sister Diana to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Diana, our companion in faith and sister in Christ, we entrust you to God. Go forth from this world in the love of the Father who created you, in the mercy of Jesus Christ who died for you, in the power of the Holy Spirit who strengthens you. At one with all the faithful, living and departed, may you rest in peace and rise in glory, where grief and misery are banished and light and joy evermore abide. Amen. That's
Hallelujah. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Now, one minute of silence across the nation. times of Westminster Abbey now as this at once solemn and emotional funeral comes to a conclusion. The body of Diana, Princess of Wales, is born from this ancient church and taken to the family estate north of London for burial on an island in a lake. 36 years of age, 16 years living intensely the public spotlight. Now departing this place, the worldwide television audience and untold members. Ancient rituals, popular performers, people everywhere in London and throughout this nation expressing their enormous sense of grief and mourning at the loss of what they consider to be their princess. We have never seen anything quite like that.
been such a flood tide of images this past week that it's hard to, in fact, in some way to keep track of all of them in our own minds. And there was so much to remember from this funeral service today, but what was distinctly unforgettable was the tribute from Lord Caltrip, now Earl Spencer, to his sister. I don't remember ever in any funeral setting anywhere such an emotionally charged tribute to it was such, stunning, Such Tom. love, such emotion, such anger, so many challenges, such passion about his sister and about the life and many ways that he was obviously forced to leave. Such honesty, too. I mean, he obviously you never hear that at funerals, spoke really. his mind about a variety of things, and I think all of us sitting here listening to it were quite stunned because I think in addition to the pageantry and the grandeur and the traditions that were shown here today, his words will resonate for some time to come. They will, and they will perfectly weighed as well. He obviously had great, given a great deal of thought about everyone, the effect that everyone would have. And it was, it was beautiful, fine English, um, as, well as, uh, as well as heartfelt thought. Tina, were you surprised that he made such a direct challenge to the royal family about the way in which the children will be raised? saying the blood family will be sure after all Charles is their father. Well I was stunned by all of it really. I mean the way he had made the obvious decision he was going to dispense with all euphemism and most funerals are comprised of euphemisms. It's about you know tactfully forgetting everything that was amiss and he decided to raise all of it and expressed it with such clarity and conviction that it has given everyone a great deal to think about. It, it, it was not just surprising it was stunning. You know the fact is that in the press coverage all this week there has been this kind of canonization of Diana and much of it in the sanctification of her memory which he asked people not to do today and he talked openly about her eating disorders about her own sense of insecurity and that's why she acted out. I, I really did not think that we would not just see this at this funeral but any member certainly of her family that would raise it in this fashion at it, this point. It was extraordinary. I mean, there's no question it was extraordinary, and I think very uncomfortable, really, for for many of the royal family in the church. Um, you know, uh, they must be on the cross as it is, and, and to hear that must have been deeply disturbing, really, because, uh, you know, everybody knew why she had been as unhappy as she was. Um, you know, I think it was courageous of him, really. I mean, he, he decided to say what he felt. And, and would not be hushed up as, as I think he would expect her, her to, to do herself. I mean, that was what she was all about. She, she said what was on her mind, and that's why she communicated so brilliantly with you know, this nation. Do you think there will be a struggle now between the royal family and the Spencers about the raising of William and Harry? I don't think so, actually, because I think, um, you know, I think Prince Charles is devoted to, to his children. I don't think that he and the Princess of Wales really had any disagreements about how the boys were going to be raised. I mean, they have this wonderful uh, woman, Tiggy Leg Book, who's the nanny, who, um, you know, is a very consoling big sister figure, and I think that she will bring a great deal of uh, empathy to the situation. The burial services uh, of the estate will be very private. Um, just ten members of uh, the family, the immediate family, will be there for that. And That's right. It, it is out on that island, right? William, Harry, Prince Charles. Lady Sarah, Lady Jane, Diana's sisters, Earl Spencer, who delivered that unbelievable tribute, her mother, Frances Shan Kidd, her butler, Paul Burrell, and Sarah and James, Jane's husbands, will be at the burial. It was her butler, Paul Burrell, who went to Paris uh, to retrieve her clothes and also sat by her uh, in the morgue. Queen Nora of Jordan. The BBC noted earlier Fifteen years ago today that Princess Diana went to Monaco for Princess Grace's funeral. We're going to go now, Katie, to Jane Pauley, who's at uh, Buckingham Palace, where she has been from the beginning. And we have commented on this today, Jane and I have. It was uh, 16 years ago that we were at that very position, and a wholly different kind of procession was coming back to the palace. It was a carriage bearing Prince Charles and his new bride, Diana, Princess of Wales, uh, the fairy tale wedding. Even though there were undercurrents of difficulty, at that time everyone hoped I can't hear what with you're all saying. their heart and all of their mind that this would be what this country and what the royal family and what Diana obviously wanted, which was a blissful union that would produce an heir. In fact, they did. William, 
an heir and a spare, as they say here, and Harry, two sons within a very short period of time. And then first the public murmurs of trouble in the marriage and then the very public coming apart of that marriage, ending in divorce. Mrs. Clinton with Queen Newer, who was American born, obviously. with his wife, Jemima. Jane Pauley, you're at Buckingham Palace. Uh, could everyone hear what was going on there, the crowd, as they were assembled and they're now watching the uh, Tom, yes. procession? Yes, exactly what I was, was thinking, that this is a crowd, and a fairly young crowd, by the way, that heard it all, stood reverently listening, which uh, makes me wonder what this enormous crowd of people will take from the experience that we've shared today, and Andrew Neal is sitting with me, the editor of The European. What do you think will be the long-term effect of, of um, uh, Earl Spencer's uh, remarks? He seemed to be speaking directly, as a, not just to make a tribute to his sister, but perhaps to uh, inspire people by her legacy of so-called unworthiness, as if the unworthy, the people who feel unworthy, are the ones who will reach out and help. Service and commitment seems to be the bottom line that I was hearing. Well, I think uh, service and commitment was the, uh, the le motif of what he was saying, reminiscent in many ways of some of the things that President Kennedy used to say to Americans. You know, that's not what your country can do for you, what can you do for your country? And I think Diana brought that back into the monarchy at a time when it seemed to be emphasizing its privileges and forgetting some of its responsibilities. The one thing you could never say about Diana was that she forgot that with privilege came great responsibility, especially for those less, uh, were, were ne more needy than we are. And, and we, we see now the car coming past us now. Just passing us. After Kennedy's death, uh, the Peace Corps was born. Do you, as you sat here listening today, were you thinking into the future if this generation of young people in particular might be permanently charged somehow by what they've experienced? Well, I think the, the lesson of the past week, and we've only realized it as with Diana's death, which is the way of these things, that Diana made us think about the kind of country we could be kind of country we might like to be. I was up at Kensington Palace two nights ago. Uh, this was a, a rainbow alliance of people there. There were blacks and Asians, poor people, middle class people, rich people, brought us together. I mean, in the, in the Abbey today, we had the Earl Spencer, Diana's brother. Uh, we had Elton John from a council house, a public house in Watford. We, we had a, a, a soprano. We had a gay singer. We had disabled people. We had Oh, all the people that we sometimes forget, and I think Diana set a yardstick that this country will now start to judge itself from. We've been the way we'd like to be here today, particularly all these young people. In the years to come, we will think, well, are we as good now as we were that day? That's the judgment. That's the call. When the Reverend made the remark about um, and how Diana touched people and made them feel significant, the people that she touched, whether it was a leper or one of the poignant letters left by the gate was from a child who said, you touched my face when I was a baby. She did make people feel uh, special and significant, but the people we're talking about are not the, the high and mighty, not the royals, not the aristocrats, not even the newspaper editors. No, she was a... Uh... She reached out to people in a way that no modern monarch or no part of the royal family ever has done before. I mean, Prince Charles does many wonderful works. He runs the, 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 uh, the, the, the Prince's Trust, which helps uh, inner city kids and the ghettos and so on. But he never quite reached to people. The, you see, she has set a new standard for a modern monarchy. If it's to survive in a democratic and much more open in a media age. Um, she, the lesson is that you cannot be cold, remote, seem to be indifferent if you want to succeed or, or survive as a monarchy. You've got to touch the monarchy, uh, the people, in the ways that the House of Windsor have yet to develop and yet to devise. This is a new start for them. Let's bring this back into perspective. Are we speaking in hyperbole now? Uh, well, I don't think we would be human if we weren't right now. Well, yes. But I, I can say that uh, Charles Althorpe, in his very powerful, quite blunt address in some ways, uh, not what you normally get at, the, at these sort of um, ceremonies, particularly funerals, spoke about William in two ways. One, a warning to the press. You're saying right now to the press, you're going to be well behaved and so on. 
Well, your test on that will be how you treat William. Well, what about it? Well, I think that I think he's laid down a perfectly proper yardstick. Mr. Hey, Editor, what about it? Well, <laughs> I'm not one of the editors he had in mind. Uh, though we're all guilty to some extent, including everybody here who buys the very papers that publish the sort of pictures he was talking about. And uh, if we allow ourselves to treat Diana, uh, to treat William the way Diana was treated, then I don't think the public will ever forgive us. Come on back to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jane Pauley, talking about one of the provocative issues, obviously, raised here when his tribute to Earl Spencer placed the uh, press at one end of the moral spectrum and his sister at the other, Katie. He was absolutely brutal in his assessment of the press. He said that he found the permanent quest on their behalf to bring her down baffling, and he said, my own and only explanation is that genuine goodness is threatening to those at the opposite end of the moral spectrum. We're joined now by Jonathan Friedland, a columnist for The Guardian. Jonathan, what did you make of those remarks? I think people probably were quite surprised how specific he was. I mean, there was no secret how angry Earl Spencer was over the press. His first remarks when he came out of his home in South Africa on the day of his sister's death said, I always believed they would kill her, although I had no idea how direct their hand in her death would be. And but I, So I think people already knew that's how he felt, but were expecting him to be perhaps euphemistic there in the Abbey on the day of her funeral, not to name names, and yet he did name names. He used the word paparazzi and then said uh, the line you just quoted, very powerful, very effective, and very direct. And I think it bears repeating that uh, Earl Spencer disinvited the editors of uh, the tabloids here in London. That's right. A lot of people thought that was very deliberate because they were, in fact, invited first. They got the pleasure of an invitation. They probably got their wives or partners to get the hat out and a special dress and knew that they were on their way to a special occasion. And then he made a point of calling them round and saying, you're on this list, or you were yesterday, you're not anymore, I don't want you there, and nor would my sister. So he made a point of rubbing their face in it. I thought the juxtaposition of Queen Elizabeth shown bringing a handkerchief to her eyes during Elton John's special rendition of Candle in the Wind. And then Earl Spencer's remarks directed at the royal family was quite interesting, saying that Diana did not need a royal title to continue to dispense her particular brand of magic or something to, that, something to that effect. That's right. I think that almost more than his points about the press is what really would have struck home. It was extraordinary, his, really an attack on the royal family there in a funeral, talk, saying we the blood family, drawing a distinction between the Spencers and the Windsors who are, if you like, outsiders and that, in, in, in terms of the grief that was being felt in, in there. And I almost got the sense he was saying that this week all this people grief he was marshalling that to his side to the Spencer side and saying you the Windsors are out of this that whole debate which had been running all week which a lot of people thought would be stilled at the, in the funeral today instead I think has been reignited by the strength of his remarks Jonathan you had a memorable line earlier this week in one of your columns in which you said that if Prince Charles does not get this he'll be burying not only the mother of his children but his own future on Saturday at Westminster. That's right. The feeling, the feeling during the week was they just don't get it to use an Americanism, that they were so out of touch and that they needed to use today to prove that in some ways perhaps they did get it. They went some way toward that yesterday by doing the walkabout, by the Queen going on live television, by seeming uh, having these various human touches, these concessions to public opinion. So they had seemed to convey that. But I think, just as it turned around very quickly yesterday, maybe it turned around back again today, on a, on a dime it turned, because the viewing audience weren't able, really, apart from the odd moment, to see the royal family, to see the Windsors grieving. Remember, no spoken contribution from, from Charles and, and Queen, but they did hear Earl Spencer. It's yep. worth noting that the crowd erupted in applause following right. that specific and, remark. And all of us uh, here, and all those specific remarks about the paparazzi, uh, about how he would raise the family. Andrew, is this... Uh, part of the emotion of the moment that there, there will be some ebbing of that do you think in the weeks and months to come i think there's bound to be ebbing um, of that and uh, nothing can stay at this sort of level of um, of uh, emotion i think that you're right in saying that it will be interesting to see how the royal family reacts i'm not so um, excited by the way in which they were forced to show their their grief publicly um, on friday i think that was very sad that they weren't able to um, to show their grief from the way they wanted. We are uh, the cortege now, uh, the, the funeral procession now is about to pass by. 
place where Doty is uh, married. He uh, was funeral services for him, obviously, were held in the Muslim tradition very swiftly within 24 hours here in London. And his father was forced to go to a traditional Muslim burial site and pick out a plot as he stood there with the uh, casket bearing his son uh, parked at the gate. It was a whirlwind romance, five weeks is all. Uh, they probably had known each other longer than that, but they began to be romantically involved in uh, vacations in the Mediterranean. And according to spokesman for the Fayed family, uh, they were very, very happy. And in fact, Diana is reported to have called one aide to Mohammed Al Fayed when she returned and said that we've all had a splendid time talking about the boys as well. And according to all of uh, many of Diana's friends who spoke with her about her relationship with Dodi Fayed, she was exceedingly happy. And many of them felt as if finally she had found some kind of peace and some kind of genuine affection in her personal life. She was also, I think, having fun at last. I mean, you know, it wasn't a lot of fun that she was allowed to have. And she was having fun in the end. She was having a holiday romance. I mean, I very much doubt it would have lasted very much longer than that. But at the time that she died, she'd had a wonderful holiday. She was with a man who adored her. Uh, he's very generous, Dodi Fayed, a very, you know, attentive, very courtly man who just wrapped her in attention. And she relished it, and she loved it, and she was having a ball. There was a sense from some of her friends, Tom, that, that she was delighted that he liked her. And I think that harkens back to this insecurity and feelings of unworthiness that unfortunately seemed to plague her for much of her life, which I thought was, frankly, one of the most heartbreaking things about Earl Spencer's tribute, that this much-revered, so glamorous woman um, still felt unloved so much of the time. I could understand her, considering was how, she was, how she was treated much of the time, with uh, close-ups on her legs to show cellulite, something that most women of her age would have far worse um, But don't you uh, think of. that Andrew was even deeper than that, deeper than the press coverage? I think, I think of course, it was in that her uh, marriage had uh, broken down. In this, I, I really don't think that we need to see this or should see this in a, as a question of the Spencers versus the Windsors because of one um, half sentence in that, um, in that address. Because apart from anything else, what more could the, could the Windsors have done other than today? I think they've, they've been um, pretty splendid, really, in everything they've managed to pull off today. This has been a fantastically successful occasion. And the Windsors, uh, specifically, of course, the two boys, have been the focal point point of it. I, I think, think we ought to remember that. I think it's absolutely right that today has been a remarkable occasion and it did bring together that tradition and modernity just as uh, everyone wanted. But it isn't. it, it just simply isn't right and, and, and probably uh, accurate to suggest that it's just a half line. It was the only moment of, in a way, real speech in the entire ceremony. The rest were existing hymns and readings. And it was several very direct and kind of barbed references from uh, Earl Spencer. He obviously feels it very bitterly. But to say, we the blood family, to say you don't have to be royal to retain a certain kind of magic. Also, to identify, again, using the specific language you very rarely hear in a funeral, eating disorders he talked about. He talked a bit about, uh, about her feeling of unworthiness, and everybody knows that the eating disorder was something she uh, acquired, contracted in that period of breakdown of her marriage. So I, I think it probably shouldn't have been uh, another round of Spencer's versus Windsor's, but it became one today. You know, uh, Tina, I think in many ways uh, uh, the overall impact of Earl Spencer's uh, tribute to his sister was that he brought her back into a kind of human dimension for everybody again. And that was the greatest tribute that he could have done. And only a brother could do that, really, and do it in that fashion. Setting aside the dispute with the royal family and all the other things, he said, remember her for what she was. Yeah, he evoked the complex, fascinating, multifaceted woman that she was. Her right. glamour, her style, her problems, her gifts, uh, uh, her extraordinary capacity for love. It was all there and delivered with this great, direct passion. It was, it was wonderful, I thought. It was the most moving moment by far, really, of the day. Because you saw, you saw her as a sister. You know, the other, uh, the other thing is that I, I think that the, the fact is that there was such an attachment to her on the part of a lot of women around the world, and that there was that outpouring of grief. Because in fact, she did have those flaws and those frailties, and that she struggled through them publicly and acknowledged them. She talked about her own eating disorder 
in public appearances. We want to go back now to uh, our continuing coverage here of the funeral procession. Martin Fletcher, who has been brought in from the Middle East for us to cover this, is uh, near the site of the mosque where the funeral services were held for Dodi Fayyad Martin. Tom, it's quite fascinating here. The streets were almost empty until just a few moments ago when the, when the ceremony ended in the abbey. Now people are pouring into the streets and the the mosque where Dodi fired with a ceremony was held for him. His ceremony, by the way, stands in stark contrast to, to Diana's ceremony, of course. It was a very simple Muslim uh, uh, ceremony. The people here are now waiting to see her, 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 her uh, Diana's body. Um, very, very quiet, silent crowd, Tom. Thank you very much, Martin Fletcher. This uh, procession will take a couple of hours, we think. The funeral services ran a bit longer than we had anticipated. Everything had gone off with kind of traditional British military precision uh, until the service itself. It ran over 15, 20 minutes. Uh, but it was so rich in so many ways and, and the very nature of it and this grand setting, uh, the richness of the Anglican services, the choice of music, the people who were assembled there. And the choral tradition, the, act, the beautiful singing that, uh, that the Abbey Choir came right. up with was in itself a, uh, a superbly um, impressive aspect of the, uh, of the service. You know, it, it strikes me as an American looking in on this, uh, that it, in seeing this service and knowing the place of the monarchy and the royal family in it, and, and it's not something that you'll want to give up easily in this country, however people may feel about the place of the Windsors at the moment, which in some ways does reinforce how, what the meaning of all of this is for this country. Well, we heard earlier on your program that Andrew Neal, the uh, editor of a right. newspaper, claimed that he was um, in favor of monarchy, but not the House of Windsor. It's a general hilarity uh, <laughs> here in the Bureau. Uh, but nevertheless, um, you simply can't at this stage have one without the other. This family has been through its Hanoverian and Sakespeare, Goten, um, manifestations on the throne since 1688. He, uh, Andrew Neil can't just decide after 300 and something years that he's going to swap them for another bunch. That's probably true, you can't pick and choose, and a lot of people want William, for example, to succeed instead of Charles. Once you get down that kind of pick and choose route, then it really is, there's no difference between that and republicanism. But on the other hand, what Tom was talking about was ceremony, and people do love ceremony, and I would say that it is possible to retain those traditions of ceremony, even without monarchy. You know, the, I've been at two presidential inaugurations, they're not bad, and you could, uh, you could have a president or a head of state who is, uh, doubles as a head of, elected head of government, and still keep some of this. This is part of our British tradition, but it doesn't have to be yoked to a head of state who's preordained by birth instead of chosen by the people. But don't you think at this point in time, Jonathan, so many people are pinning their hopes on young William, that he'll be able to uphold the, the wonderful tradition and yet bring the best of Diana's qualities to bear? That's certainly what people are really hoping for. He is the heir to the throne, but he is also the heir to Diana's legacy and the fact that he looks so much like her, that he has that glance up through his fringe just like she did. It's almost, um, like, I it's think almost like the house of Spencer. Yeah. Yeah, come next, but I don't think that England wants to plunge itself into a constitutional, you know, vacuum just because of the Queen's inability to emote. You know, I mean, I think, um, nor should they. You know. I think there are plenty of good arguments for that which are separate to the failings or flaws or even uh, strengths of this particular family and that argument has to be made and will be made over the next few years even decades well let me ask you about that Tina about that very thing that you were just saying I you know it strikes me that I have a number of friends uh, here or from here like you and so many of them I find are conflicted on this very point uh, you know that they, they struggle with this whole idea about whether it should be a Republican country again and whether the the uh, royal family really now is anachronistic, setting aside the idea of the Windsors here. Do you think that that debate will be intensified by as a result of all of this? No, I mean, I think there is a real need for a, a royal family. I mean, in England, particularly in an age of such sort of transient, you know, ephemeral celebrity, uh, the monarchy does stand above that and stands aloof from that. You know, year after year, the monarchy stands for the dull continuum of people's lives, you know, that's reassuring, uh, you know, in, in the fast pace in which we live suddenly spawned this extraordinary global star in, in Princess Diana and of course that did show us a different kind uh, of more you know modern more democratic uh, more appealing way of being royal uh, but
let you know that Queen Mother had that kind of gift too. It's not only, only Diana. Every so often someone does arrive who has it. I think there is a strong uh, possibility that Prince William might, may have it too. You know, she did say in, in June that she hoped he would grow up to be something like John F. Kennedy Jr., who'd been sort of schooled in the ways of, of being more communicative. And I think there's a strong possibility that may happen. We, uh, we want to go back now to uh, some of the people who are assembled here. You did hear uh, rounds of applause during uh, uh, Earl Spencer's uh, tribute to his uh, sister, the tribute that was so angry, so challenging in so many ways. Jody Applegate, however, is down in uh, the crowd now with someone who uh, felt quite strongly the other way. Jody? That's right, Tom. Peter Champion is an off-duty London police officer, and I'm interested in getting your reaction to Earl Charles Spencer's remarks. I thought it was inappropriate at the funeral. I can understand his anger, but I think that uh, members of the press should be invited because there needs to be a dialogue between um, the stars of this world and the world to do and the press so there's a better understanding between them so that perhaps we could avoid what happened to Diana. Do you think it's fair to blame the newspaper editors or do you think there's blame to go around? Well, we all, we all um, looked at the television, we've all watched, we all watched television, we've all read newspapers. I think perhaps the proprietors could have shown more restraint in the past, but we, we are all responsible, we all read newspapers, you can't only blame the press. Also, as we've been talking behind us, I don't know if you can see it, a giant flag has been unfurled that says St. Diana rest in peace with a halo on top of it and of course the Earl Charles Spencer also said please don't canonize my sister she wasn't a saint do you think there's any danger that, that that's happening there is a danger but I think it would be wrong she was a privileged person but she used her privilege to do good to help people out the people that are marginalized who needed help and um, she wasn't a saint she had her problems they, they were well known to all of us um, and I think to make her a saint wouldn't be right. As a police officer, I'm sure you've seen a lot of things over the years in this city. Have you ever seen anything quite like this? No, I haven't. It's extraordinary. I've never seen anything like this in this country. Why did you want to come down here today? Well, I could have watched it on the television, but I wanted to come down here in person to pay my respects. I wasn't concerned whether I could see anything or not. And you certainly heard what happened inside the Abbey. Peter Champion, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. I know it's a difficult time. Back to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Jody. The voice of the people, uh, a voice that kind of strikes a middle theme, if you will. Uh, let's go back down to the audience now, to the crowd that is assembled here at Westminster Abbey and NBC's Kevin Tibbles. Kevin. Tom, the Archbishop of Canterbury said a prayer to the Lord of the brokenhearted. I spent the service on the street with the brokenhearted where people weren't self-conscious about the fact that they were weeping openly. Men, women, children, dare I say, uh, police officers, uh, even journalists were standing here and no one was self-conscious about the fact it was dead silent in London this morning and I've never heard it like that in all the time I've lived here. I'm standing with Lisa Fulton, who has traveled all the way down from, from um, Coventry in the north of England to be here. She followed the cortege as it came to Westminster Abbey. And uh, I'm just wondering at this point, now that Diana has finally left, do you believe that she has actually left us? No, it's very hard to believe. What, uh, I mean, what brought you down to here today from Coventry as opposed to watching this event on television where you could have seen it as opposed to being 15 back in a crowd? Um, my heart, I guess. I just had to come down to make myself feel better. Were you surprised at the reaction of the people around you and the silence in the crowd? Yeah, it was. Um, I was at Kensington Palace and as soon as the cortege started coming out, this um, coloured lady started crying out, Diana, Diana, and it was like really moving and everybody just started crying and it was hard. What are you and your friends going to do after this? Where are you going to go to console yourselves? Um, well, we're going to drive back to Coventry now, but hopefully see on the M1, go past it or... Will you be visiting all four? Yes, we go, we're all going on Tuesday. I had um, a bouquet, well, a heart-shaped bouquet made up with red roses and a ribbon with Diana across the front of it. So we're taking that there on Tuesday rather than all the flowers be taken away to wherever. The day you're not going to forget. No, Lisa, Lisa Fulton, thank you. Tom, back to you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, a lot of people are concerned in the village of Althorpe that uh, they may be inundated with visitors in the uh, 
first few weeks especially and then they wonder what the lasting impression will be the spencer family is thinking about uh, creating some kind of a memorial outside of the park some place where the people can go to pay tribute to diana on a continuing basis let's go to buckingham palace now and to nbc sarah james and as we do that we want to remind you that we're carrying not just on nbc but on msnbc on msnbc.com uh, on the computer oh, sarah james one of the things that strikes me here is the fact that even after the cortege has followed by for the second time, still how quiet it is. There are still thousands of people here. It's as if now this is over, they're not quite sure where they're supposed to go. We've talked to several of them about their reactions to the funeral, and I wanted to talk to some of them now. Jane, you were telling me about your thoughts. What was the most moving part of the funeral to you? I think the, um, her brother's speech was very moving, both in that he touched on their own personal grief, but also how she affected everyone else around the world. You said that you've found some media hypocrisy. What do you mean by that? Well, one day she's being vilified by the press, and then the next day she's deified, and I just think the tragedy is that it takes her death, or it's taken her death for people to realize what she meant, you know, and to get off all the negative focus. Now, I also wanted to talk to you, Wendy. You went all the way down the route. Why was it so important to you to literally follow that casket? Because she's someone who's touched so many lives. She's opened up doors for us and made it possible to understand the monarchy a bit better. And uh, she's made the untouchables somewhat touchable to a certain degree. Do you think that there is a message in Diana's funeral and in the outpouring of response for the royal family? Well, yes, they have to open their doors and make it possible for um, William to become the people's king when he gets the chance, like his mother, to follow in the footsteps of her mother, of his mother, sorry. What was the most moving part of today's ceremony for you? Uh, at the beginning of the procession outside Queen's Gate when the coffin was entering into the park and the bells were tolling and everyone was completely silent and stoic and it was very heart-wrenching. Did that suddenly make it seem real? completely real it was finally it i wanted to talk to one last person here i'm not getting a chance to talk to everyone but rebecca how old are you eight and why did you want to come today because um i missed all the hard work that she had done for all the little children will you miss diana very much yes was today a really sad day to be here yes all right, well, we'd like to thank all of you. This is just some of the sentiment that you're hearing today, and I think it's one of the reasons why it's been so quiet here. Everybody is here with their own reflections, their own thoughts about the passing of Diana. Katie? Sarah James, Sarah, thank you so much. As we look at these pictures of the funeral cortege, we should mention that it is approaching the M1, which will lead it on its 77-mile route to North Hampton Shore, where the Althrop House, which is called Althrop, Althrop. Althrop in Althrop. this country. Yes, but spelt Althorpe. Right. Um, yes, it's the it's the stately home of the Spencer family. They've been major landowners there since the um, mid 16th century, and the family vault, which we've been hearing about, has contained dozens of generations of this family. Uh, she will be the first significant figure not to be buried there, but on her, on her own plot, as, uh, as Tina was mentioning earlier. The Queen has returned to the palace, we should mention, and the Spencer family, and as well as Prince Charles, are taking the train up to Northamptonshire for her burial. Yes, this is quite reminiscent of Churchill's funeral, where uh, the family, and indeed the body, took the, uh, took the train to uh, Blenheim Palace, or at least uh, the village, village church nearby. It was interesting. I don't think you can underestimate the level of vitriol that has been expressed toward the press in general, tabloid or mainstream, in this country and really throughout the world. We got into a taxi, and we tried to give the taxi driver a generous tip for transporting us, and he said, he gave the receipt for only the amount of the fare and said, I don't want your money. There's a lot of anger towards everyone who works 
in the business. There really uh, is. People haven't discriminated at all. You know, on the very first day when people started gathering outside the gates of Buckingham Palace, ordinary people who were taking their own snapshots for home right. were, were elbowed out the way as if, as if they were perhaps members of the press corps, of a kind of uh, uh, unofficial paparazzi, because they were just taking their own pictures. That is that level of ill feeling. Well, I, I'm afraid that's the other side of the coin, because those of us in the press too often stereotype all manner of people. You know, we make collective judgments, and so they're making a collective judgment about us. Tina, she was a luminescent figure in the popular culture, obviously. Uh, she was larger than life. Who is there around that will step into that enormous void that has been created, or do you think that there will be a re-examination of the need for someone like Diana for People Magazine or your old publication, Vanity Fair, or for that matter, The New Yorker, or for any number of uh, publications, including the electronic press and all the magazine shows and so on. Is there anybody else out there? There is nobody remotely approaching uh, the Princess of Wales in the incredible blend uh, of symbolism that she had. I mean, you know, the, the combination of the glamour and the, and the royalty and the troubles and the, and the goodness and, and, and the modernity of her made her totally irreplaceable. Um, it's, it's very difficult, really, for the royal family today because there's nothing they can put up, really, to, to distract the enormous hole that she's left. Um, people are going to have to get back to something far more quiet and, and humdrum again. And uh, gradually her, her mystique will, will, I suppose, you know, fade in, the, in that really intimate sense. Uh, and people are going to have to get used to something else while they wait for William. And I think that the greatest pressure really is on, is on him now. Well, the discussion of the royal family this week reminded me of Henry Higgins and My Fair Lady saying, why can't a woman be more like a man? Why can't the royal family be more like Diana? Well, the fact of the matter is, the royal family is not Diana. And perhaps it's unfair to even ask the question. Uh, it almost certainly is unfair, but I think this point, this uh, expectation that maybe the mystique will fade over time, there's an equal risk, I think, that actually the myth will get larger and that the Diana legend will become actually larger than she was in life, that the flaws will get sort of airbrushed out by uh, contemporary history, and that she'll be a bit of Marilyn Monroe, a bit of John F. Kennedy rolled into one, and the royal family will be pale by comparison. The, uh, the people who were at the funeral are now exiting uh, Westminster Abbey, and I'm going to do a little directing from here, which is not uh, uncharacteristic for me, and just ask uh, our control room if we can uh, begin to share uh, with our viewers through the camera some of the people who are coming from there, because it was so exceptional to see uh, the people who were going in, and I know that we only caught a glimpses of a few of them as this funeral procession now approaches M1, which is the name of the highway here. We call ours I-95 as M1. And there, and there you are. You can look down into that crowd. I see Tom Hanks actually coming from there, or did. All the men dressed in black ties and white shirts, the official wardrobe of the morning here and Victoria Mather covers the royal family Tom here in London and has been very outspoken in the last week about the royal family and I'm curious I know that she'll be speaking her mind again today I'm curious what she thinks of Earl Spencer's Sir. tribute to Princess Diana Victoria pretty what did you think of the tribute? I mean, and were you surprised by it? I was quite surprised about how bold it was, how courageous it was. I think everything has changed from now on. Um, I think everything's changed for the monarchy, and I think everything's changed for the press and the relationship between the press and royalty and celebrity. But tomorrow, what we shall see in the papers is just one word, which is mummy. People may have lost their princess, and the world may have lost a living legend, but two boys have lost their mummy. And that was the little note on the cushion of white roses on the front of the Princess of Wales's coffin. Mummy, in Prince Harry's childish hand. And that, more than anything else, will perhaps protect the boys for a little time. But Earl Spencer was angry, very angry, and he was not afraid to show his anger. He was not afraid to show his emotions. And I think perhaps what the royal family has learnt during this traumatic week is that the showing of emotions is a good thing. They can't change overnight. We saw yesterday Prince Philip taking the flowers from people in the crowd and instead of placing them rather tenderly um, on the ever-growing pile in front of the palace, he was sort of throwing them down. 
he didn't really quite know what to do, but he chose to walk behind the casket today, and um, the royal family chose to come out and to salute the coffin. Um, as the Princess of Wales went past, the Queen bowed her head to Diana. In fact, when Earl Spencer, I thought, quite poignantly addressed the boys and said something to the effect of, think of how we're feeling and she isn't even our mother. We can only imagine the pain that you're enduring right now. Yes, I think this was um, very sensitive of him. And throughout, he referred to his sister's sensitivity, her style, her sparkle. But the most pointed remark of all was not even when she lost her royal title. No, she needed no royal title to continue her magic. Andrew Morton has something to say. Andrew Roberts, rather, Andrew, has something to say about that. I think it's a little unfair to complain that the um, Duke of Edinburgh threw down flowers. The man is uh, in his 70s, and uh, so it's a little bit more difficult for him to bend down quite as far as the younger princes did. He didn't. I was watching the same, um, the same pieces. He was not throwing down flowers in any sort of disgust. He was letting them drop when they were as close to the ground as he could have got them. I think that um, obviously, yes, one has very respect for a man of 70 years old, but um, it, it, it is difficult for him to know what to do in those touchy-feely situations. Victoria Mather, thanks very much for talking with us. We're joined now by Lord Geoffrey Archer, who was inside during the funeral service and can tell us a little bit about what went on in Westminster Abbey. I think really what was probably the most remarkable moment in what I would call my political career, really, was that after Earl Spencer had finished the speech, the applause started in the crowd outside. The people at the back of the abbey picked it up and joined in, and it moved through the abbey. I had the very great privilege of sitting in the sixth row behind the cortege, so I was literally opposite the cortege, and it didn't reach us. It reached us in a sort of sweep. And it was a crowd-led reaction that the Abbey picked up and joined in. And that has been the case, as I've said to Tom before, all this week. The crowd, the people, and the people's princess were led by the people once again. Did the royal family pick up on that applause? I confess to not being physically able to see them at that moment. I'm not avoiding that. I genuinely couldn't. But certainly all the people in the Spencer benches, and I say I was one row behind the family, the immediate family, they picked it up, but none of us picked it up. That's the real point, until the crowd had led it. Lord Archer, what was the reaction in the Abbey when uh, Earl Spencer said, we, the blood family, will raise uh, William and Harry in the manner in which you wanted them to? Did the air go out of the Abbey in a manner of speaking? Well, I felt all through that speech two things. One, he must have spent a very long time. I've had the privilege in my lifetime of helping with speeches with two prime ministers, Margaret Thatcher and John Major. So I know the amount of work that goes into not every sentence, Tom, every word. Right. He thought out every word, and I began to realize a third through. This was no casual speech. He'd made a political decision. He was going to make this speech, come hell or high water, and it will be remembered. You see, Elton John had just finished singing, and I mentally thought, wow, that is nothing. I'm going to beat that a minute. And along came this young man, and made a speech which must have shocked an old pro like you. Well, I thought, the other thing I was struck by was the construct of it, the dynamics of it, the, the way that it built. He talked in such a personal way about his sister at the beginning, yes. about her insecurities and about her eating disorders, and it was a touching, real portrait. And then you had this kind of crescendo beginning uh, in which he, his anger then began, in almost a volcanic way, began to build. And, I think Andrew made the uh, remark earlier that it was extraordinarily well constructed word for word, phrase for phrase, and the orchestration of it could not have been more brilliant in some But the amazing thing was, I also picked up as a speech writer and speaker that he had a message to deliver, and once he delivered it, which was about 30 seconds from the end, he broke down. Right. The last 30 seconds, he fell apart because the message had been delivered and the rest went back to the love for his sister. It was fascinating. I've got to deliver this message. And once he delivered it, 
Did you notice he creaked and crumbled and nearly, nearly broke down? Well, that's often the case, though, when people speak at three well, They well, try that, to get what, through it, and then at the end, they break down. What were you all saying to each other on the way out of the alley? My wife said as we left, although I knew, Tom, you were waiting for me, my wife said, I just want to take as long to leave as I possibly can. You will remember in the original semesters, they suggested that it was going to be 45 minutes. It actually was one hour and ten minutes, and I don't suppose I got out for another 20 minutes. You didn't want to leave. You knew you were present at an occasion the like of which you would never attend again in your life. You wanted it to go slowly, and you wanted to be there until the last moment. It Lord. was that remarkable. Lord Jeffrey, we heard Victoria Mather say the enduring symbol of this day, in your her view, would be those roses on top of Princess Diana's casket with the card that said Mummy yes, from her son that was Harry. Very remarkable. Were you able to see well, the princes? They very uh, the princes or the card. No, the the two prin the Prince William and Prince Harry. Uh, yes, we saw them both come in. We saw them walk with their father, uh, the Prince of Wales, and place the flowers down. All of that was very moving. The whole family being there was very moving, and I think. As at the beginning of the week, I think I told you at the beginning of the week that when I heard at ten past four in the morning on Sunday, woke my wife, she, her immediate sentence was those poor children. That was her first sentence, those poor children. And I think what's come through this week is these people out here, that's what they most care about. They adore William and Harry and they won't let anybody stop them having the life they were right to. In fairness to Prince Charles, any number of people that I've talked to this week who know him well also say, you know, he has that very cold uh, public demeanor, but that he's a wonderful father, that he has a very strong relationship with him. I have a story about that. I was um, having lunch privately with uh, Princess Diana about, I think it was six or eight weeks ago, and we were going through to the tiny dining room where we were dining together passing lots of pictures, and I might say, incidentally, one with her with Mother Teresa, and what a sad piece of news that is. But one with Mandela, one with Mother Teresa, one with... And, but dozens of William and Harry, and the very latest William and Harry picture had just been framed. And she turned and looked at it and said, he's growing very tall, isn't he, Jeffrey? And I said, he certainly is, Mom. And she said, and you know which side of the family that comes from, don't you? <laughs> but she <laughs> then said, one, when I stopped one. laughing, she looked at me very firmly and said, and Charles is an outstanding father, and the children adore him. Well, Jeffrey, we'll ask you to pause there because we want to go to the M1 now. The flowers are coming off the hearse. The uh, serious part of the motorcade now is about to begin uh, the 70 mile trip north to the family estate by motorcycle escort. There will be great crowds there as well. Uh, the burial service will be private and we want to remind all of you in the United States who are just joining us now that we are here in London at 1 p.m. But in New York and across the country, this is a special edition.